Notre Dame fans, welcome to another edition of the Irish Breakdown Podcast. My name is Brian Driscoll. I'm the publisher at irishbreakdown.com. And tonight we're going to break down some film. We are going to talk about the offensive linemen in the 2022 class. We are going to begin with going over the needs for the class for Notre Dame, what Notre Dame should be shooting for in this class. Then we'll talk about the things that I look for in offensive linemen, the most important characteristics that I look for in offensive linemen. And then we will dive into the film. We will first start off with the committed players for Notre Dame in the 2022 class. And then we'll dive into the uncommitted players. We'll start off with the tackles, and then we'll go to the interior players. So for all of you that have been begging for me to talk about the big boys, if you're not here tonight, we're going to have to have words in the next podcast you're in because tonight we're going to talk about the big boys. And obviously this is an area that needs to be a strength for Notre Dame. This is an area where Notre Dame needs to be strong every single year. Notre Dame cannot afford to ever take a step back when it comes to the recruiting and the development of the offensive line. That is the one position that Notre Dame has always and can always recruit with anybody when they have even remotely competent offensive line coach. And so that's just that's there's no excuse if you're not developing the offensive line if you're not recruiting the offensive line in Notre Dame you, you need to find somewhere else to go and so that's the that's sort of the the burden that's on coach Quinn's shoulders is obviously he needs to coach up the offensive line at a high level and he needs to recruit at a high level recruiting at Notre Dame under coach Quinn has been a little bit up and down and you know his first class the 2019 class was strong uh, it was a class that was put together mostly by Harry Heastan. Coach Quinn finished it. Uh, you look at the 2022 20 class, getting Tosh Baker was a huge pickup. I still am very high on Tosh and his future. I was not expecting Tosh to be ready to play by 2021. So the fact that he still has room to go uh, and room to work is not a surprise for me. He needed a lot of a lot of technical and then obviously weight room work. You had Michael Carmody, who I like a lot, but then you missed. You had a lot of misses. You missed on Jimmy Christ. You missed on Peter Skaronsky, and some of those misses were evaluation mistakes. Notre Dame got on Peter Skaronsky late. They did not value Peter Skaronsky the way that he probably should have been valued. And then, of course, though, the manner in which they recruited Jimmy Christ and the fact that when he committed to Virginia, Notre Dame stopped recruiting him. Penn State did not. And then when things went south at Virginia, he decommitted and went to Penn State. So there were a lot of misses in that class. For Notre Dame, and they flat out came up short on numbers. And so now you're in a situation where you come into the 2021 class and there's a big need for numbers. Notre Dame did very well with the one-two punch of Blake Fisher and Rocco Spindler, and you you have to give Coach a lot of credit for that. But there are a lot of misses in that class too. You had an opportunity to get you know Wyatt Milam in that class. You had an opportunity to potentially get Nolan Rucci in that class. You missed out on Landon Tangwall, and there were some recruiting strategy problems in that class. You didn't you didn't emphasize Wyatt Milam enough. And then by the time you started to turn the heat up a little bit on him, it was too late and he was going to West Virginia. So Notre Dame then ultimately had to shift gears and they ended up getting Joe Alt, a player that I like, who's got a very high ceiling, but also a player that, that's going to need some time to develop. You got Patrick Coogan, who primarily to me is a depth player at a place like Notre Dame. And you've got Caleb Johnson, who's a good solid football player, but not really a needle mover type of offensive line player. So they got good numbers, but the impact, the depth of talent was not there. For example, in the 2017 class, you had a trio of Aaron Banks, Robert Hainsey, and and, uh, Josh Lugg, and then Dylan Gibbons was your number four. We're not seeing that kind of depth. The 2014 class, for example, you had 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 Quentin Nelson, you had Alex Bars, but you also had Sam Mustafer. So there was always a really, at least a really good three deep in those classes, and that's where Notre Dame came up short, in my opinion, last year. Now, They recovered relatively well, getting Caleb Johnson, who's a good player. Like I said, I like Joe Alt. But that's put him in position here in the 2022 class where Notre Dame needs a combination of numbers and more impact talent. That's the tough part. You know, getting three to four, at least three to four high-level players in this class. And this is a class that if Notre Dame doesn't hit a home run in the 2022 class in the offensive line, you have to start asking yourself some questions about, can Jeff Quinn really recruit at an elite level at Notre Dame when it's all, all up to him? That's the c- question mark. So far, he's off to a great start. You've got Joey Tanone in the class, which we'll dive into. You've got Ty Chan in the class. Two relatively high rank, highly ranked players that I think could continue climbing up the rankings. And you have a board in place that we're going to dive into tonight that if you can have success closing out on your board with the right players, 
this has a chance to not only be sort of a class that meets the needs that Notre Dame has, but it is a class that is can, can be sort of that it's as good as anybody type of class. It's a class that you can say, hey, look, Notre Dame should be recruiting at an elite level, and that's the elite level that we're talking about. And we'll dive into what that class looked like. If you were in part of today's chat, uh, this afternoon when we kind of went over the gap closers type of situation, how big this June is, then you you know a lot of who those players are. But we'll also dive into that tonight for people who maybe didn't get to be a part of that show. So that's the needs for the class for Notre Dame in the 2022 class. I would prefer at least one more tackle in the class, but I think they can get away with not getting a tackle uh, if they're able to get the right interior players. But they've already got at least one tackle in the class, and I think there's potential for some of the interior players to possibly pay tack play tackle as well. And we'll dive a little bit into that. So let's talk about <clears throat> what I look for in an offensive lineman when I'm breaking down film. And I think these are important. These are important traits that, that I look for. And the, the first of all is I look for the size of an offensive lineman. Now, what I don't care so much about is a player's current weight. It doesn't bother me too much. What I care about first and foremost is height and length, length being the prefer over, preferment over height. As we saw in Liam Eikenberg this past year, he's a guy that had a lot shorter arms than most people project a tackle to have, but he had very broad shoulders. He was very tall, so he was very long, even though he didn't necessarily have long arms. He could play long. So I do like the combination of height plus length with length being the emphasis. I look for frame. So if a guy's 300 plus pounds, but he's kind of a chunky, uh, let's be honest, fat kid, okay, then you say, okay, well, can he lose weight and still play at a high level? Uh, if a kid is undersized, so it's 275 pound kid or 265 pound kid, you have to look at it and say, what are his what's his shoulders like, right? Does he have real narrow shoulders or does he have big, broad shoulders? You look at his overall body makeup. Is he a kid that has kind of skinny legs? Is he a kid that has thicker legs? Is he a kid that that is a has a really thin upper body, but it's a broad upper body? Those are the things you look for. You know, does he have big feet? Does he have big hands? Because what's that? What that's going to tell you is if he's a little undersized, you say, okay, he has the kind of frame that you look at and say, yeah, he's going to be able to put on that weight, but not just put on put on good weight and then maintain his athleticism. That's a big question mark, and that's not always true. Look, anybody can get up to 300 plus pounds, but can you play as a 300 pounder? And can you handle that 300 pounds athletically? And those are the question marks that you look for. So then your next, the next topic is strength. Now, what does strength entail? Strength entails, uh, it's about power. So do you have powerful hands? It's about your core, which is your midsection. Do you have explosive hips? Can you really come off the ball and explode into a blocker? And then it, it goes it goes down below. So it goes top to bottom. And the below is, do you have real strong lower body that allows you to be a finisher, that allows you to, to really get movement? So if you and a defensive lineman kind of hit each other at the line and you're stalemated, do you have the explosiveness and then the lower body weight to then take that stalemate and push them back in your favor. Those are the things you look for. And then, you know, part of the upper body strength is is twofold. Number one, it's that initial punch. That's important. Do you have really powerful hands? There's some guys who are strong players, but they're not necessarily powerful punchers. And we see that in boxing and it's true in offensive line play where, you know, a guy may throw up a lot of weight in the weight room and when he gets his hands on you, he can kind of toss you around a little bit. But what I look for is you want that, you want that weight room strength, you want that sort of that that ability to, to kind of move people. But what I also look for and, and what can be harder to find is do you also have that shock power? And so that is that ability is when you strike, do you can you knock a, can you lock a guy up and get your hands on him and kind of because once if you have the kind of hands that when you strike a guy and he kind of does this and you have a you have that lower body, that's when you finish. Right. And if you go back, if you watch Quentin Nelson, whether he was at Notre Dame or now in the NFL, you know, Quentin's obviously a great weight room guy and he's big and he's strong. But if what, what separates him to me from other guys of similar size and other guys with similar weight room strength is he's got such tremendous initial punch where he's just going to knock you off balance with that first shot. And it's almost like if you're a boxer, it's almost like, you know, do you have that jab? where, you know, some guys are just jabbing to score points, right? And there's not a lot of pop behind it. They're just scoring points. Then there's that guy that's got that jab where he hits you with that jab and it, it kind of stuns you because it's coming with some power. Then he follows up with the bigger combinations that can knock you out. 
And so, or knock, you know, you get, you knock you off balance and then you can deliver that knockout blow. And it's the same thing for an offensive lineman. Do you have that initial punch that allows you to kind of knock a guy off balance or kind of get his, get him rocked back a little bit that then allows you to pit finish for an offensive tackle. It's also important to have that because that punch is a lot of times going to be the difference in your ability to stop a speed rusher. If a guy's beating you off the edge and you're able to kind of get strong hands on him and kind of knock him off, that's going to allow you to cover. It's also going to make his path harder. Uh, if a guy is going to bull rush you, do you have the weight room strength to kind of handle that anchor and then lock him out? Those are things that you look for as well when we talk about the strength of an offensive lineman, which is very important. And then does the guy, if a if you have a young player that's maybe undersized, and this is one of the things I like about George Fitzpatrick from, from uh, Colorado, who we're not going to talk about tonight because he's not really on the board for Notre Dame anymore, but I have questions about George Fitzpatrick being able to gain enough weight to, to play at a place like Notre Dame and maintain his athleticism. But one of the things I loved about him is he had a really powerful hand. He just he could shock you. And, and there's a couple guys we're going to look at tonight that have that. And that's going to allow you to be a good puncher and a good finisher. And those are things you look for. But but he didn't necessarily have great weight room strength, a great size, but he had that punch. So if you felt that he could gain the weight and have the weight room strength, then you really like something. But if you have that punch to work to start with, that's obviously going to be very important for an offensive lineman. Next, let's talk about athleticism. Now, speed is not important for an offensive lineman. And I know there's a lot of people that talk about 40 times and all that kind of stuff. And no one over of you know this 40 time has ever been good or whatever the case may be. I, I don't care much about that. Ronnie Stanley had a horrible 40 time. And he's turned out to be one heck of a of an NFL offensive lineman. I care more about other athletic traits. Number one, initial quickness. Now, for an offensive, for all offensive linemen in the run game, that is your ability to, to explode off the ball with quickness, to be able to step, to get your feet moving, not to lift up, because anyone can lift up quickly. It's can you step as you're lifting up quickly and beat that guy to the to the point of attack. Essentially, the guy that that there's three things you look for when you're talking about quickness off the line. It's quickness with your feet to get going, quickness with your hands to shoot a guy, and then, of course, being able to play with good angles. But those two quickness aspects, quickness with your hands and quickness with your feet, a lot of times are going to determine who wins. Now, obviously, there's things like pad level and leverage and all those kind of things. But if you are playing with decent pad level and you're, you've are you got quick feet and quick hands, you're going to win a lot of battles. Those are important things. Uh, so foot quickness is very important. For an offensive tackle – it's even more important to be able to get out of your stance quickly, uh, to be able to handle the speed rushers. And and look, any offensive tackle that's worth the salt, like even a decent offensive tackle, can get out of a stance quickly enough to beat an edge, to stop an edge rusher. What you're looking for, however, is guys that don't have to basically kind of turn and almost sprint where they're out of control with their foot quickness. What you look for is that guy that just has that natural foot quickness where He's quickly getting out there, but it's a natural quickness, so he's not overexerting himself. What happens if you have to overexert yourself and because you're not fast enough or quick enough to get out there is, you're A, you're going to be off balance, and B, you're, you're most likely going to narrow your base or you're going to have some sort of crossover because you're almost like you're, you're, you're really sprinting out there. And then number three, you're, you're not going to have the kind of anchor you need to handle it once you engage. And so that's why that quickness is so important. Uh, I look for hip hip flexibility. That's important for guys to be able to handle double moves. It's important for guys to be able to work with double teams and those type of things. Uh, that also is about foot quickness. You know, can you step one direction and then open up and step in another to handle line games or to handle speed rushers or to, or if you're blocking down and you got a linebacker kind of on a blitz or, 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 or stunting around, you know, do you have the hip flexibility and the quickness to step out? And then of course the punch and the, the strength to then to deal with it. So those things all kind of come together. Um, you look for quickness when it comes to movement stuff. So how quickly does a guy get to the second level? Can he work quickly while maintaining a good base? Some guys, hey, look, a lot of offensive linemen can quickly get up there if they're going to lift up and sprint forward. Uh, but can you work quickly and keep your base? That requires a greater level, a level of athleticism. You know, can you get around on traps? Can you get around on kickouts and pulls the same way? Now, there's a lot of guys that can get around on traps with good speed, but again, they have to lift up and almost sprint to get out there. They have no base. They're not coming with any power. Can you maintain that pad level? Can you maintain that good lower body base? Then work quickly and deliver a strike. 
those are the things you look for. Uh, do you have the agility and athleticism to turn inside? So a lot of guys can be good trappers, and that's just opening up and kicking out, right, or coming down, and it's just a straight line. A, a What I'm referring to is a guy that steps back and can work and then work up the field. That's a different level of athleticism than just a quick trap. Okay, so I look for those kind of things. I look for foot quickness in those areas. I look for hip flexibility in those areas. You look for foot quickness in almost every area is going to be important. Then there's agility. Agility and foot quickness for me are not the same thing. Now, they work together a lot, but they're not the same thing. Foot quickness is essentially just your ability to go in, a, in one direction. Agility is your ability to plant and redirect with quickness. So I've seen guys that are very quick out of their stance. But when they have to plant because they have either they're either not flexible, they have tight ankles, they have heavy feet, whatever the case may be. Uh, heavy feet is more of a technique thing. It's not like your feet weigh eight more pounds than somebody else's feet. That's just a coaching term. Uh, but can you plant and redirect, change direction? So if you're an offensive tackle and you're quickly getting in your stance, you got a nice base, and that guy does a double inside move, or maybe he goes outside and somebody comes inside, you got to step off to that. Can you plant? and turn quickly, redirect your body and with quickness and force. Those are things that you look for when it comes to agility. And those two things, as I said, don't always go hand in hand. If they do, then that's kind of what you're looking for. I talked about ability to adjust and to move, all wraps all those things kind of together. And then another thing that I look for is balance. Balance is, the, is an important thing because you'll see guys that have quickness, guys that have strength, guys that have great frames, but they're not great blockers because they don't have, now they may be great high school blockers, but they get to college and they don't have great balance. Balance is partly about, the, we talked about the agility, the change of direction. That also requires balance. Being able to, to plant and, and, and keep your base as you move forward, not lose your base, not have to lift up and get high. It refers to being able to get hit and then quickly gain your balance, just like a running back, right? Because there's going to be times when you're going to come off the ball and you're hitting a guy and somebody's going to crash into you. One of your guys may even crash into you. You know, Do you have the balance to be able to play through that, or does that knock you off base and then you kind of stumble and fall? Balance is also important working up to the second level. You know, Can you keep your base? Can you work quickly? Can you hit guys as you're going this way? Uh, those are things that, that play into balance. Technique is another thing that I look for, obviously. I want a guy that plays a good pad level. I want a guy that's got fast hands. Offensive line play is a little bit like receiver for me in that I care more that you have the physical talent than I care about you have great technique. I prefer got offensive linemen to have both, but that's kind of, again, that's why you, you pay these coaches a lot of money is to coach guys up. But when you look at the offensive linemen, you know, I care if a guy has fast hands and heavy hands, I care more about that than if he has good technique. Uh, if a guy has really good athleticism, but his footwork is a mess, or he doesn't play with a good base or things like that, that that's okay. I, I can coach that up if you're an offensive line coach. And, and so those are the things you look for. But but I do evaluate technique because I think technique is is part in, is is a part of how quickly you can be ready to play. You know, so does a guy play with good footwork? Does he does he keep a good base? Does this does this hit, does his feet get too narrow at times? Do they get too wide at times? I want a guy that has a really nice athletic base. Those are things that I look for when it comes to technique. Your technique in that you don't turn your hips a lot. You don't necessarily want offensive linemen turning their hips a lot. You want to kind of stay on sort of a vertical path to where if you're blocking this guy, can you quickly come off if there's a looper or a stun or a guy does a spin move? Those kind of things. You know, is, he, is he able to kind of stay square to the line of scrimmage as much as, as you possibly can? Those are things I look for. Uh, is a guy, when he, when he takes off and he's getting into his pass sets, does he have – too wide of a stride? Does he have too narrow of a stride? Does he lift up out of his stance? A lot of guys get that real nice base at the snap, and then you know be before the snap, and then as soon as they the ball snap, they just lift straight up. Chest comes out, narrow their base. That's something you look for. There's an expression you're going to hear a lot in football when you talk about offensive linemen: is he a knee bender or a waist bender? Essentially, what that boils down to is is a guy. What you want is when I'm coming off and I'm blocking forward. I don't want to have straight legs and be leaning forward where all the bend is coming at my waist. You don't want that. You want a guy that's going to have nice, you know, kind of a, it's kind of like a, if you're thinking about a baseball or a basketball player, think of a guy on a free throw line that's up there and he's shooting and he just doesn't move his legs. His legs are tight and he's just kind of flicks it up there. 
that's 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 not a guy that's got really good flexion in his knees. But then you have that guy that can really quickly get down and lift up on his jump shot. That's knee bend, right? Not everybody has that, and you want that in offensive linemen. So those are things that I look for in run blocking, leverage, how you use your hands, working your feet through contact. That's a big one that you see with a lot of long, young offensive linemen where they'll hit a guy and just kind of stop their feet. I want to see guys that naturally – this is something that's very important. for. This is probably the – the technique thing that I value most because you can't always teach this. Some guys are just naturally when they feel contact, they're just going to stop. I want guys that when they hit, they're going to keep moving their feet. I, that's something that's very important for me. And you're going to see some guys on film, especially some of the interior guys that are excellent at that, that they just, man, they just really work their feet and drive through contact. So you're going to want to look for that when we're watching film tonight, you know, how they handle through double moves. I like finishers. I like guys that have that little extra something that they're just going to, Put a guy on the ground when, when you're engaged. So those are things you look for. Playing with good angles. You know, so when you're blocking, you're not just coming down with with just, you know, hey, you're 45 degree angle no matter what. Are you, you know, can you do you understand the need to play to the high side of his shoulder? Do you need to understand the hey, you got to play underneath the guy? Do you know you got to work around the guy? You, you know, when you're in pass pro, you want to keep that guy sort of on your outside. Do you understand angles to the point where you're not you're not oversetting to let him beat you inside? You're not undersetting to let him beat you outside. Do you understand that patience that is involved with playing good angles? That's another thing. So those are the different things I look for, a guy's instincts and how quickly he can react to things that are happening around him. You'll see guys on film that are big, strong guys, but if you throw any kind of movement at them, they, they, they don't see it. They struggle with it. And those are things I look for. And I think the biggest mistake that, that a lot of people make, and this is especially true, in my opinion, with all due respect to the National Recruiting Services, is they get so wrapped up in how dominant a guy is in high school that they don't realize that his dominance comes from his size. And when he gets to college, if he doesn't have great feet, if he has tight hips, all those type of things, then he's not going to be good in college. And I'll give you an example. There was an offensive tackle that, that Notre Dame was looking at, and at the time a lot of people thought Notre Dame had a shot at him. I didn't want him. And I'm glad that Notre Dame made the choice not to recruit him. He ended up going somewhere out west. But he was really highly ranked. And I remember talking with one of the evaluators of one of the services, and we were having a good chat, you know, talking ball and things like that. And I, he, I said, well, what? You know, he asked me what I thought of that kid. And I said, I don't like him. I, I don't think he's a great player. I think he's a little overrated, those kind of things. And the thing I said to him was, watch him. He's like, well, you know, look how dominant he is. And he blows guys up. I said, that's great. I said, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home tonight, and when you watch this kid, uh, w- when you watch a kid and you look at his – when you're watching his film, okay, I only want you to watch him from the basically the waist down. Don't watch his upper body. Don't watch what he's doing on the block. Just watch him from the waist down. You're going to see heavy feet. You're going to see a guy that has tight hips, a guy that doesn't bend, and a guy that's going to struggle with athleticism at the next level. And lo and behold, he watched it, and he called me. He was like, holy – you know, you, you were right. Like, I see what you're saying now. But – when you just watch a guy dominate high school players, you can kind of miss that. And I think that's where you see a lot of the misses is they guys they'll under the they'll, they'll two less. Hey, we're not worried as much about his, you, know, you worry too much about his size and power. You don't worry, you know, you, you undervalue a guy because he doesn't necessarily have the size that you're looking for. I think that's why we see a lot of two and three star offensive linemen end up going to the, to the NFL and, and being very good football players from, as far as where they were in high school. So those are the things I look for. And then obviously positional flexibility is something that factors into my grades. Injury history, competitiveness, motor, effort, all those things are part of that intangibles grade that I look for uh, when I'm breaking down film. Okay. All right. So let's dive into the board. Let's first talk about the committed players for Notre Dame in in the 2000, the 2022 class, Notre Dame's first commitment on the offensive line in the 2022 class was Joey Tonona, who is a a really good football player. Here's the interesting thing about Joey Tonona. So when, uh, when he was, when he was looking at Notre Dame, when Notre Dame first started recruiting him, he was actually a tackle. And we're going to actually, when we watch Joey, we're going to dive into, uh, we're going to first look at his, at his, his sophomore film when he was a, a an offensive tackle. And I and I liked him. I thought maybe he might be a better interior player, but I thought he did some things that that could allow him to be an offensive in an offensive tackle. And I still kind of believe that. 
So I had to send this document to myself so I can open it up here on the other computer. So uh, he was a guy that I looked at and said, hey, I think I think that guy could be a really, really good interior player, but he's got some tools to work with as an offensive tackle, and we're going to dive into that. Then as a junior, he moved into center, and he was excellent. So even as a tackle, I like Joey Tonono. And I think that's an area where you could say, hey, if there's a need for another tackle in the class, Joey Tonona, part of the value that he brings to this class is I truly believe he can play all three positions. And by three, I mean center guard tackle, not necessarily left and right, left and you know, right inside and then center, just center guard tackle. And, and he is a, to me, that is very important. He's a guy that ranks as the number 141 player in the country by ESPN and then all the way down to number 201 by rivals. What I like about Joey Tanona, again, that factors into this is ESPN ranks him as the nation's number one center. 247 Sports ranks him as the nation's number 16 offensive tackle. And rivals ranks him as the nation's number six guard. So all three services rank him on three completely different positions, which I think speaks volumes to the versatility that Joey Tanona brings to the offense. So let's talk about Joey. And Joey's a big, strong kid already. You know, he's a guy that I think can add can add another 10 or 10 or 20 pounds of, of good weight, but he's already a big, strong kid. He's kind of what you'd expect. Uh, you know, if, if we're going to talk about stereotypes, he's a guy that you kind of expect to see uh, from a big Midwestern offensive lineman. And so let's dive a little bit into this. Now, remember, this is Joey's sophomore film. And so this is him playing offensive line or uh, excuse me, offensive tackle. So let's dive into that here real quick and take a peek at what Joey Tenona brings to the table. He has the left tackle. He's number 79 in the team with green uniforms. So let's talk about Joey Tenona and look at what he does. You see nice long arms is the first thing, a big kid. So he's got good quickness out of, out of the stance. It's the first thing you look at. But his footwork's a mess, as you'd expect kind of from a sophomore. Okay, now that's what I call being a waist bender. So you want to talk about that? Watch, he doesn't bend his knees. When he lunges into the guy, he's lunging from his waist. He's moving his upper body, but he's not bending his knees. Now, the good news is he's so strong that he can still just throw that guy to the ground. And that's something that I really I really like from him. So he's able to recover and just throw that guy to the ground, which is important. He's got that country training. And again, this is him as a sophomore when he's only about maybe 275, 270 pounds. This is good quickness off the ball right here. Good coming out of his break. He's a little high. Not great foot speed, and this is one of the things you look at and say, this is why I felt he was probably a better interior player. But the other thing is you look and say, okay, is he not getting out there as quickly because he's not quick, or is it a footwork thing? So if you watch Joey here, okay, so I want you to watch something on this film, okay? The first thing I want you to do is you find out, look what he does with each of his first two steps. What you're going to find is this is why you have to say, okay, a guy's not quick, or a guy doesn't get outside. So the first thing you ask yourself is, is he not athletic or is it a technique problem? And with Joey, as you're going to see here, this is more of a technique problem. So as you're going to see here, his first two steps are simply picking his, his first step is he's drop stepping here with his left foot. This is not what you want. And his, his, his near foot, he just turns. So his first two steps, he doesn't gain any ground whatsoever. But he recovers because I do think he has decent foot quickness. So he's able to recover. And then, of course, you see his strength to go win at that point in time. So that's a very impressive play there by Joey. Base is a little bit too wide out of his stance. It's a good power, good toughness. This is what I'm talking about. You see strong hands. Watch him kind of shock this kid. So as soon as he gets his hands on this guy, and it, this isn't even great technique. As soon as he gets his hands on this guy, and this is an undersized player, but he just knocks, rocks the guy back. The guy's on his heels. That's a lot of power right there. Again, it's not the kind of guy he's going to be facing in college, but you, you can see some really good tools there. You see it here, too. This is a little bigger defender. He's able to kind of knock the guy's upper body back. You see that guy kind of bows his back a little bit. That's what you're looking for. Now, here he doesn't work his feet through contact. That's something that I would correct if I was, if I was his offensive line coach. He loses the angle. That's an effective high school block. That's not going to be an effective college block. So he plays a little high, but he's a strong kid, and that's the thing you like about it. He just has to learn to bend at the knees a little bit. Now, that was actually, to be honest with you, part of the reason that Joey improved so much for me from a ranking standpoint coming out of high school this past year is because when he moved over to offense to, to the interior position, as you're going to see here, I want to watch a little bit more tackle film. 
But what you're going to see is that his ability to play with bend was improved when the inside. So what that tells me, it was more of a technique thing than it was a lack of athleticism thing. This is going to watch a little bit more of him playing tackle. Really like his quickness off the line. He's just got to learn to – he doesn't get a lot of steps forward. That's an issue for him. But you you got to see the toughness and the quickness and the power that he plays the game with. Strong kid. Moves well in space. Decent athlete. I'm just going to watch a couple more clips of him as a sophomore because I really want you to see his junior film. Here we go. There's not a lot of him pass blocking. This is one. He's got decent foot quickness. Plays with a good base. He just has to sink. He just plays too high. You know, you see relatively fast hands there for a young kid. Just has to learn to strike. He's kind of just placing his hands on a guy. One thing Joey has to learn to do is to strike. Use his hands as a weapon. And he doesn't really do that, which a lot, be honest with you, a lot of young guys don't do that. That's not a surprise for a sophomore. And there's a comment in here about his flexibility. That's why I say this, you have to ask yourself, is it a technique thing or is that just what he is athletically? And I think that when you watch him as a junior, again, this is sophomore film. When you watch him as a junior, you're going to see a different kind of athlete. And it's because playing inside has forced him to be more to play with a better base. Now, this is Joey playing center. So here he is right here playing center, right? This is from his junior year of high school where I really felt like his game exploded. You can see he's got a little bit more weight on him, a little bit more lower body power. He works quicker off the ball. He still plays a little high, and I think he's got a little bit of just natural waist bender in him, but we see him playing better as a sophomore with a little bit better bend as a sophomore. Or, excuse me, as a junior. Base is a little wide as well. See that? He's got, to me, that's good foot quickness right there. That's getting out of your stance. The issue I see, however, is, again, look at the stance. He's got such a wide split there that his first step is basically to reshift that weight and then gain ground, which is going to slow him down from getting to the target. But that's not a foot quickness thing as much as that is a technique thing. There's a little bit more film of him as a sophomore or as a junior. That's a big boy they're moving off the line. So that's him getting to the second level. Again, he's just got to learn to play a little with better pad level. And that's one of the things that keeps him from being a top 100 player and keeps him as a borderline top 150 guy as, a peer, as opposed to a top 100 guy is that question mark that I have there about, is he a natural waist bender? That's a punch right there. I like that. Again, that's not going to happen in college, but I like the attitude. I like the toughness he plays with. There, there's what I'm talking about, playing a little bit better base out of his stance. And then as he starts to engage, watch him. He, he narrows his feet, but he's he's crushing the guy, but he's going to have to learn to keep that base. You narrow your feet like that against college guys, they're going to knock you back. That's a little bit better, kind of keeping that base as he works at a second level. I like that. And then you see the strong hands there. That's that's impressive. He's got that ability to just finish. That's that second part of strength that I talked about. That just ability to move a guy once he's blocking them. You see strong hands. Again, he's going against some undersized high school kids from Indiana. So he should be doing that. But you, you have to like what you see from him. And by the way, Zach Rice is not 280 pounds. We'll get to that here in a little bit, but he's not 280 pounds. He's closer to 300 pounds. All right, so see a little bit more of Joey Tanone, and then we're going to move on to Tai Chan. We're not going to spend a lot of time on Tai Chan because we only have sophomore film. It's not great film, and um, but we'll, we'll talk about Tai Chan. See, that to me, that's good quickness. But again, his footwork is more the issue. But that's as far as his feet are moving quickly. He's getting where he needs to get to quickly. He's playing with power. He's got fast hands, powerful hands. He just has to improve his technique. Takes over that guy relatively well. Again, my thing with Joey is he's got a he just needs work as a from a from a standpoint of overall technique. But I really thought he he looked more far more comfortable inside, in my opinion, than he did outside. See, again, that's a technique problem. See, he's got his hands outside, but he's really strong. He's able to overcome it. 
works his feet through contact. Again, when I see Joey Tonona, I see a kid that's got the size that you're looking for at the position. I see a guy that's got the the base that you look for from a power standpoint. I see a guy that has all the tools that you want. He's just a guy that needs to learn to play with better technique, play with better leverage. And really that is the thing that's keeping him from getting to that next point. And I see there's a lot of questions. I'll get to the questions at the end. This will be like sort of a podcast form. Get to the questions at the end. If you really want something answered right now, you can throw in a super chat, but I'll get to those. And we'll talk about each kid's recruitment as we work through it as well. Okay, so next let's watch Ty Chan. And again, we're not going to watch a lot of Ty Chan because his, his is sophomore film. He did not get a chance to play um, as a junior. That obviously was um, disappointing because he has such upside, but he just needs raw. He's he's a really raw kid. So let's watch it. He, a lot of his film, too, as you're going to see here, is of him playing the defensive line. Now, Ty has talked, you know, Ty's put some things out lately. That's him playing defensive end, by the way. Number 70 playing defensive end. That's him, I believe, right here. Okay, but what you're going to see is he's he's talked about he's up to 300 pounds now. He's thrown around big weight. He's always kind of got it thrown about around big weight. It's just how's he going to move at that weight? And that's the question we don't know. But what you see is a really tall kid. He's got well above average arm length. This is really good foot, you know, quickness off the ball. Now, no one blocks him, right? So I don't really care about the highlight of getting into the backfield. It doesn't, doesn't matter to me because he doesn't get touched. But I like the quickness off the ball. You're seeing a guy that's his first step is gaining ground. It's not picking it up and putting his down. It's his first step is gaining ground. For a tall kid, he plays with pretty good pad level, stays low, and delivers a hit. Again, a lot of this is him playing defensive end. So it's just, it is what it is. There's just, and this is why I don't rank him as high as others, because for me, I just, I don't have a lot to evaluate him on, but I see size. I see athleticism for that size. I see a guy with a really good frame. I have confidence that he's going to be able to play at 300 pounds, but I just need to see it now. Here's a little bit of him playing offensive line, playing right tackle for his high school team. See good foot quickness. Got to keep his hands a little tighter. This is something you see from a lot of young offensive linemen. You do not want to see their hands on the back of that guy's body. Both of his hands are on the back of that guy's body, but he's got good foot speed. I like what I'm seeing there. He's a good athlete. Comes off the line quickly. See that base? See, that's what I'm talking about. Look at that. Now, he, he's got a little bit of a bend over at the waist, but that's, I mean, you're going to have that. But look at his knees, right? Look look how much bend there is in his knees. See that? Oops. You see that? Look at that bend there. That's a knee bender. That's what I'm talking about, right? That's something you really like to see is he's really in that stance. And then look how he moves out of it, right? Look how he explodes out towards the quarterback. That is something you really like to see. That's the kind of thing that gives you a lot of hope and confidence that as he gets more experience, you're going to see him being able to play really athletically on the edge. Again, you're going to see it there. A little bit of a forward lean there. Gets a little bit of a waist bend there. But you see you see that leverage. You see a guy that he, you, he understands, I'm really tall, and I've got to learn to make sure that I'm playing with good leverage. That's important. Good quickness, good instincts. Look how fast he gets his hands up there. Well, it's fast hands. I like that. Good length. It's a good football player. He's just raw. Just very raw. Here's more defensive film. He's actually inside that guy. It kind of looks like they're showing him as the edge player, but he's not, he's on the inside there. Good power. Gets inside that guy. Good foot quickness. And that's something where I think playing defense is going to help Ty Chan because he understands the leverage. He understands how to beat an offensive line. That's another example. Look at that knee bend. Right. Look how quickly his feet are working there. Again, this is something if you know how to evaluate film, you're seeing these things. Yeah, I'd like to see him do it as an offensive lineman, but I'm seeing him do those things. That's something I'm looking for. That's that's good. I like that. He's got good arm length. He's not a defensive player. Right. We can all agree on that. He's not a defensive player, but that experience for him in high school is going to really help him. Here are some offensive line clips. See what I'm saying? He's a lot of technical work. Now, he looks way less comfortable right now playing offensive tackle than he does defensive line, right? I mean, that that's the reason that 
he gets a little bit of a lower grade for me. He is not the, see. Remember we talked earlier about the knee bend that we showed on defense. It's gone now, right? It, it standing straight up. He's completely erect. That's not a highlight, but you know, there just aren't a lot there. And those are the things that he's going to have to work on, but you can see on defense, you can see a lot of the traits that Notre Dame really likes. And now if he's legitimately up to 300 pounds, he can still move like this. You know, this plays another example. You're going to see how much more comfortable he looks playing defense. So he's going to need some time to develop. Just as come off the line, he just he's coming off low. He's keeping his he's keeping his pad level down. Good knee bend. He doesn't do that as an offensive lineman. It'll come. It'll come. I didn't put these clips together, Chris. He did. Again, fast hands and instincts. You have to like that. Let's get one more clip of him, and then we're going to move on. So I'm saying he just looks way more comfortable as a defensive lineman right now than he does an offensive lineman. And we're going to see him as a senior get a chance to kind of prove that because his offensive clips are not pretty. And I think now you're kind of seeing why I don't have him ranked as high as others. But there's a lot of tools to work with. Now, and the other thing is I, I did read, I, I think he was in an Under Armour All-American camp recently, and apparently he did very, very well. I haven't had a chance to see that film yet, but apparently he did very, very well. And so that's a positive. Okay. That is Ty Chan. That is the two players that are committed to Notre Dame right now in the 2022 class. I think that's a good start. But one of the things that I talked about today in the chat, and it's, I'm going to reiterate it now, is they're off to a good start. But how good this class is, is going to be determined by where those two players rank on the list. If they're the top two offensive linemen in this class, it's a good offensive line class. It's not a Notre Dame caliber offensive line class. The more guys you can get that are at or above their level, that's how you get there. Now, again, these are both starting caliber offensive linemen. These are both guys that can not only play at Notre Dame, but can be very good at Notre Dame. But they're also guys that have a, a couple more holes than maybe some of the other players on the board have. And, and that, to me, is really the key of, of what we need to, to, to look at. So what we're going to do right now is I'm going to put on some Zach Rice film. And I'm going to let it play for a couple minutes. I have to quickly go grab something while you're watching film of Zach Rice. And I'll be right back. So Zach Rice's highlight film is about nine minutes. We won't watch all that, but I need like 90 seconds. So just watch this film of Zach Rice while I am taking care of that. I'll be right back. And the one thing you're going to see is this is junior film of him. He is the right tackle. He's number 50. He's a big, 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 strong physical kid and a very dominant football player.
All right, so have you guys been enjoying this uh, this Zach Rice film? Now, here's the thing about Zach Rice. I really like this kid, and I think he's big. I think he's physical. I think he's strong. He's dominant. I don't know if I would put him ranked as high as he is ranked right now. And Chris mentioned he's the fifth-ranked player in the country. That's on the composite list. He's ranked number 10, according to, to SI, but... I think he's a big, strong, physical kid. I just – I don't know if I think he should be quite as high as he's ranked because I don't think – the thing is, he's fit big, physical, strong, loves demeanor. But I don't know if he's an, if he's the kind of elite athlete that I look for to be a guy that's ranked that high. Um, I wasn't saying it wasn't high. I was just clarifying, Chris. But I don't know if I would rank him quite that high. I don't see – the elite foot quickness. Like, for example, I don't see a kid that is a junior has the athleticism that Blake Fisher had, for example. Um, as a sophomore, I definitely thought he was a guard. I think there's more right tackle to his game now. And and what I still am trying to figure out with him is, is it a technique thing? Is it, it Can it be improved with technique? Can he get to a college weight room and, and really – Add a lot of that extra weight. Those are questions that I have, but I absolutely love his physicality and demeanor. I think he's a very good football player. I graded him out um, on my breakdown as a, as a top 100 player, right, which is very good. I just don't see a guy yet that is a top 50 or top 25 kind of guy. There's a lot of upside there, but like right that right there, like this is what I would say is like, you know, not all highlights are highlights. <laughs> Kids think some kids think a highlight is a highlight, but it's not really a highlight. This is not a highlight for Zach Rice. He's coming off high. Guy beats him inside, but it's a bootleg. So of course he's gonna get out. But that that's not necessarily what you want, but he finishes well and he thinks that's a highlight, but that's not really a highlight. I also don't see a guy with incredibly long arms. But if you're someone who likes big, physical, tough kid that's just gonna have people on the ground all the time, then then Zach. Then, then I think Zach Rice is certainly your guy. Very good football player. And, you know, earlier I was talking about how I think what happens is a lot of times these evaluators will look at a kid and look how dominant he is. Because So here's an example, right? So you watch Joey Tanona play and you watch Zach Rice play. Well, Zach Rice has far more dominant film. But I think that's partly because he's bigger, he's stronger, and he plays at a you know, level competition where he's got a tremendous demeanor. But is he necessarily 150 spots higher than Joey Tonona? I don't think that he is. But I think what happens is, is a lot of these analysts get, they kind of fall in love with how dominant the film is. And, and look, there's a lot to like. Zach's a top 100 player, in my opinion. But I don't see elite, elite five star, next Quentin Nelson next Ronnie Stanley, next Liam Eikenberg kind of guy. I think he's very good. I think he'd be even better at guard. And, I've, and I've, I've kind of felt this for a while. I think he can play tackle, but I think that kind of kid, he's more of a phone booth kind of guy, and, and that's an expression you hear a lot. But basically that means is you want a guy that can kind of play in short areas. And I think, you know, Kai just made a point in the chat. I don't think Zach would be as dominant in college. Agree, not as a tackle, but I do think as a guard, he could be a really good guard because he's got good straight-ahead foot quickness. I don't see great agility with Zach Rice. Uh, I don't see great bend with Zach Rice, and he looks like a guy that I don't know if he's ever going to have that. Like when you watch him play, you hear the expression tight ankles. Watch, this is a great example of that. Like his feet are just kind of stiff. His ankles are kind of stiff. They don't really bend. I just don't know if he has the athleticism to necessarily be an elite player. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why when you hear me talk about the offensive line, I don't talk about Zach Rice a ton, partly because I don't think Notre Dame is going to get him. But the other reason is, is I don't see a guy that is, I don't see the same level of player that you might see in the rankings. Again, I like him. I want Notre Dame to recruit him. I think he'd be a very good player. I have him as a tackle here because Notre Dame's recruiting him as a tackle, but I still view him as more of an in, in, inside player. I think he could be a good tackle. I think he'd be a really good guard. All right, so that's that's Zach Rice. Okay, uh, big strong kid. 
Let's talk a little bit about Zach Rice's recruitment. He is essentially down at this point in time. He's kind of got a top five of Ohio State, Virginia, Alabama, Notre Dame, and North Carolina. He was in North Carolina today. He is going to be at Ohio State this weekend. He's going to be at Virginia the weekend of the 11th. He's going to be at Alabama the weekend of the 18th. And he's going to be at Notre Dame uh, the 25th. And that's going to be his last official visit of the summer. I think he's a kid that when he gets to Notre Dame, if he gets to Notre Dame committed, they have a shot to impress him. I think he's a kid that's going to really like Notre Dame. Whether or not that is enough for them to overcome the likes of Ohio State, Alabama, uh, that remains to be seen. I think Notre Dame, if I were to if I were to predict, I would say that if if I had to just based on what I my sources and those type of things, if I had to say where does Zach Rice where does Notre Dame rank on Zach Rice's list, I say they're probably fourth or fifth. I think Alabama, Ohio State, and North Carolina right now are all ahead of Notre Dame. Could that change in, in November 25th? Sure. But I don't know if it's going to change as much as it would for maybe some other players. So that's where things stand with Zach Rice. As I talked about, big kid, strong kid, physical kid. Just question whether he's a tackler or guard. And I and I don't know if he's as he's a tremendous high school football player. He's going to be a really good college football player, but I don't know if it's going to be the same type of edge dominance that you're going to see. And, and I don't see a guy that's necessarily even a great pass blocker. And I've seen some camp stuff. I've seen some stuff of him in high school. He's not necessarily a great, great guy. John A1, appreciate the super chat, my man. Really, really appreciate that. Glad that you were able to make both of the I think you were in today's show earlier t- today too, but I get you and Jay mixed up a little bit but thanks for being a part of the show all right so next next i want to talk about jake taylor now this is one of my this is one of my favorite offensive linemen in this class and he's a kid that to me is a is a, is a raw kid i've compared him to robert hainsey in that i think that he is a you know i think he's a guy that has a lot more uh, uh, he's he's not as sound as Robert Hainsey was at the same age, but he is a guy that, and again, we've only seen sophomore film him because he didn't get a chance to play as a junior because of, of the stuff going on in the state of Nevada with COVID and all those type of things. But he's a kid to me that I look at and I say, but that's the kind of kid that you say, man, that he's got a chance to be really, really good. Very high ceiling there. Um, a guy that you say, you boy, that's the kind of kid that you look at and say, if you got good coaching and you can coach that kid up, he can be a really good player. And he is from uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, Bishop Gorman High School. Obviously, comes from a great program. You know, and when I look at Jake Taylor, too, the other thing I see is I see a kid that has a lot of room to grow. He's ranked as a consensus four star recruit. 24 7 sports has him ranked number 218 in the country. Rivals and ESPN have him as a four star. They do not have him ranked in their top. It'd be 250 for rivals, 300 for ESPN. I would have him that high. I have him as a top 200 player right now. And I think his ceiling is even higher than that. So he's a guy that I like a lot more than a lot of the recruiting services. I think this is a kid that has a very, very high ceiling and a guy that I like. And I'm going to pull his film up here now. This is some film that I was able to put together of Jake Taylor from his huddle clips. So we'll take a peek at that now. Uh, and dive into uh, to Jake Taylor a little bit. So he's number seventy nine. He's a right tackle. Now, now watch. See, so th- so this one I'm talking about. Watch this quickness off the ball compared to what you just saw from other guys. Uh, that's the big thing I look at from Jake Taylor. So I see a guy that just explodes off the ball. That's a really good base right there. Okay, I talk about a guy that's got some knee bend. That's it right there. Now there's going to be other clips from Jake Taylor where you're going to see him looking high. He's, he's looking like he he's not a waist bender or he is a waist bender. But then you see clips like this where you see him with that really good knee bend, which tells me he's got some technical problems that cause him to be a bit of a waist bender. It's not that he lacks that ability. So this is the thing I see. Watch. Now, he I don't want to see this wind up right here from, from guys. He wind, kind of winds up, coils his hands. I don't want to see that, but I love the strike. Look at how much he moves that guy. He's a Bishop Gorman, so they're playing good teams. I mean, that guy is off on one foot because of that hit that he delivers to him. That is a physical, physical play right there. That's a really impressive play by Jake Taylor. I don't know where that highlight's coming from. All right, see this quickness. I'm gonna, 
I'm going to pull this down. I'm going to pull up some other Jake Taylor film because this is not necessarily playing great here. So let me just pull this out here real quick. So the video is not playing great today. Sometimes this is a new feature for, um, for StreamYard, and sometimes it doesn't necessarily play great. So let me see if I can get to it this way, and we'll watch it. Because I really, really like this kid. I want you to get a chance to see what he can do because I think he's a very, very underrated player. I really like Jake Taylor. So let's get let's let's try it this way. Okay, yeah, this should be a little better. All right, so this will be a little bit a little bit cleaner film, I believe. So here's at right tackle. Look how quickly he's out of a stance there. Again, this is just something. There's just he just plays with a different speed than some of the other kids that we've talked about in, on, in this breakdown. There's a right tackle. Look how it just explodes off the ball. Really nice bend and just shocks people. Really love his athleticism. Now, keep in mind, this is sophomore film. This is Jake as a sophomore at Bishop Gorman. Look at that athleticism on this pole coming up. This is really impressive. It's this next clip. Really gets around, gets up to that second level. He's got his eyes upfield, finding his target. This is a really, really impressive kid. Again, look at that quickness. Watch him work, work his feet through contact. Love his athletic ability. Now his stance is a little bit, a little bit narrow, which again I think hurts him. But watch him get low and just drive into this guy, and then just work his feet through contact. But he's got a, he doesn't like cross his feet. He's just really working his foot quickness. I really like this kid. Just opening up that hole. This kid can really play. And again, he's a, look nice, look nice patience on the edge there. He's got to get a little bit more bend. He's got to strike a little bit more. But he's patient. He and he anticipates him. This one thing I like about this is he sees this double move coming and he's ready for it. Washes it down, just stones the guy. Watch the base he plays with. Look at that. Keeps his base, redirects. That's really good stuff right there from Jake Taylor. I love this kid on film. He is to me, he is my top tackle on the board. There's no question about it. Look at this base, trying to bend, keeping his hands, being patient there. He's got this recoil thing where he's got to coil his hands up before he strikes, and I hope that he's worked that out now. But you see him anchor there relatively well against a smaller player. I, this kid's really an athlete, a really a really athletic player. Here's another play of him moving. You'll see this trap. Look how quickly he is. Again, base way too narrow in his stance, way too narrow in his stance. He's giving away that he's pulling. This essentially is what he's doing. But again, sophomore film. Look how quickly he does. Now watch how he's able to get low and hit this kid. This is a smaller defender. I really like this pad level from Jake Taylor. This is a really impressive play. He's got long arms. And look at that finish. Works his feet through contact. Bam. And then just finishes the guy off. And, and again, now watch a lot of the a lot of the pancakes that we've seen from other guys are linemen taking guys and throwing them, right? Can we all agree that you're not throwing Myron Tungvaloa most like that, right? You're not throwing the kids at Bama like that. What I like about this from Jake Taylor is he's finishing the right way. Square up, face to face, just drives his feet, pushes his legs, and just puts a guy on his back. That that's the kind of finish you want to see. Handles that double move again. Really fast hands. I love his, his hand speed. Keeps the guy out. Look at that double move. Doesn't phase him at all. This is really, really good stuff. Really good stuff from this kid. Good base. Again, he's got his hands get too wide. He's got to get his hands tighter. But that can be worked on. His feet never stop moving. Remember earlier I said guys have got to work their feet through contact? Jake Taylor's one of those players. Just watch how his feet never stop moving. Now, some, the, some of the things you get worked on, he's a little bit too much on his toes here. Again, that's a technical thing to be worked on. But what you have a, what you can have a hard time working on as a coach sometimes is getting a guy to actually move his feet. That is not an issue with Jake Taylor. Look, a good anchor there. Again, guy tries to spin out, and he just – look how fast his hands are on that double move. Hits him. Guy spins, gets his hands on him again, puts him on the ground. It's a really impressive kid. Really impressive kid. Let's see that clip again. Fast hands. And again, this is sophomore film. So he's a year older, year stronger. This isn't even junior film. Look how he locks out. I love this. Guy tries to run right through him, puts his hands on him, and just locks him out. Love this. Really, really good clip here. Keeps his base. 
Now, what, what some guys can do in this situation is they lock a guy out and then they've got this urge to, I got to finish him. I got to finish him. And so then they kind of lunge at him. This is great patience here and maturity as a player by, by Jake. He just stays on it. Guy comes at him, keeps his base, just locks him out. And if the guy just wants to stay outside, then you just keep him outside. But you don't lose him. This is just this is just a great job. That guy quit on the play because he just was getting dominated by Jake Taylor. So here's him getting up to the second level. Now look at this base on the second level compared to what we've seen from some of the other guys that we looked at, from Joey Tonona, from Zach Rice. Look at that. This is a 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six kid. Look how low he is. So this is what I say. When you see those clips of him being a waist bender, it tells me that those are instances where it's a technical problem, not a, a physical problem, because this is really, this is a really good base here. This is really well done by Jake Taylor. This kid, and this is why I've always said, if you get this kid as your tackle, that's an elite offensive line class. I don't care what his ranking is. I don't care. This kid is, a, is one of the best, in my opinion, one of the best offensive tackles in football. In, college, in high school, in, in the 2022 class. No question about it. Some things to work on. He's got to get stronger. There's a lot to like about Jake Taylor. Fast hands again. Very. This is against uh, St. Louis, I believe, out in Hawaii. So if you uh if you so this is Jake Taylor. Does this does this player he's going against right here look familiar? Let me tell me that. Does this guy look familiar to any of you Notre Dame fans? Can anybody tell me who that is? This number 12 that he's going against in this film. Anybody want to take a guess? Right there, that guy. He's not going to, now. This is it right here. Anybody know who that number 12 is? That's Jordan Patelho. Now, if you watch Jordan Patelho's film, he got some wins on this again in this game too. But Jake Taylor's handing himself as a sophomore against some very, very good football players. You see him stopping there. You see him stopping Patelho on this on this play right here. So look at him. Well, see, Patelho's trying to get him to the outside. He just gets that arm out, and just rides him outside, showing good strength, good punch. That's a heck of a play right there against a what I think we would all agree is a really, really good football player. This is an impressive clip, too. This is a big kid he's going against on this next play. And you see him anchor and just stone him. Look at those. Look at that arm length. People say, why does arm length matter? That's a perfect example. That guy cannot get into his chest. It's locked him out. This is a really, really good football player. All right, so that's Jake Taylor. Again, I think I think you guys are starting to get a little bit of a glimpse as to why I'm so high on Jake Taylor and why I tend to put more into film than I do recruiting rankings. Because according to the recruiting services, he's not a top 200 recruit. According to uh, rivals, he's the 37th best offensive tackle in high school football right now in the 2022 class. According to ESPN, he's the 38th best offensive tackle in the 2022 class. If there are 37 better offensive tackles than Jake Taylor in this class, this is the greatest high school offensive tackle class in history. He is an absolute outstanding, outstanding football player. Athleticism, check. Length, check. Motor, toughness, effort, check. Uh, technically sound for that age, check. Ability to finish strong hands, check. It's upside, check. Uh, Jake Taylor, to me, is an outstanding football player. Now, let's talk a little bit about Jake Taylor's recruitment before we move on to Joe Bruner. Uh, first of all, he's down to a final three of Alabama, Oklahoma, and Notre Dame. He's going to visit Notre Alabama this weekend. Next weekend, he is going to visit Notre Dame, the 11th to the 13th, and then the 18th, he's visiting Oklahoma. This is one of the instances where I'm glad Notre Dame is not last because my big concern, I don't, I don't, I think Alabama's a player, but I, they're not the team I'm most worried about. Oklahoma is. This is one of those instances where I'd be really concerned if I was Notre Dame about Jake Taylor committing during his Oklahoma visit if he visited them first. The fact that Notre Dame gets him on campus before Oklahoma is a plus. 
He's the kind of kid to me, Oklahoma's going to be hard to beat, but I think he's the kind of kid that will be more blown away, more impressed, more moved by a visit to Notre Dame than, than some other kids. He's one of those guys, when I talked earlier today in our show, that Notre Dame has to knock June out of the park. He's one of those guys I have in mind. When you look at the fact that I do think that they're in it for him, they're obviously in his top three. I think he likes Notre Dame. They've been on him for a long time. But Oklahoma's just been able to really develop a strong connection. If the Notre Dame staff can really knock this visit out of the park and they need to accomplish one of two things, right? And they're both wins. One is obviously get him to commit to you when it's all said and done. That'd be great. If you can't get him to commit, then you have to hope that you can at least give him enough to think about where he doesn't also then commit to Oklahoma a week later. If you can drag this one out, that could be at benefit Notre Dame. Uh, uh, unless, of course, they're able to convince him that, hey, this is the place he wants to be. But he, the visit's going to be super important for Jake Taylor. But I think you all saw in film, he's a great fit for what Notre Dame does also because Notre Dame, and this is, this is something we'll talk about now, and I wanted to wait for Jake Taylor now. A lot of people look at like the Bama linemen and even the Oklahoma linemen and the Ohio State linemen, these big kids. And they look at Notre Dame, and Notre Dame's guys are like 305 to 295, you know, maybe a couple guy here and there, uh, it, you know, get up to 320 or whatever the case may be, but it's not often. And to me, Notre Dame's system is dependent upon athletic linemen. I think Oklahoma and Alabama require a little bit more size, big physicality. They're more, they have gap schemes, they're more power driven offensive lines. Power is important for Notre Dame. But the type of system Notre Dame runs with the outside zones and the counters and things like that, even the way that they run their inside zone where you've got to really cut off the backside and get up to the second level, athleticism is far more important than size. Athleticism, leverage, and technique. And so that's why I think, to me, Jake Taylor better fits the Notre Dame offense than he does those other systems. But that's something now that the Notre Dame staff has to convince him of. And that's going to be the big challenge uh, for him. So I think – we saw Zach Rice. We saw Jake Taylor. For me, if I could only have one of the two, I, I would take Jake Taylor. Now, Zach Rice moves the needle more from a recruiting standpoint, but as as far as just a pure offensive tackle, Jake Taylor is my number one tackle on the board for Notre Dame. There's a lot of work to be done, but that's a, that's a recruitment they have to win. It's not going to move the needle a ton from a recruiting ranking standpoint, but I think more importantly, it moves the needle from a, a – talent of the player standpoint. And I think the fact that he is down to the arguably the three best offensive line programs in the country, Alabama, Oklahoma, Notre Dame, should say a lot about his his talent relative to his ranking at this point in time. Um I'll, I'll get to Chris. I'll get to your question on the O line, Notre Dame versus Oklahoma, because it's not the gap that you think that it is. All right. So, next up on the board, let's talk about Joe Bruner. Joe Bruner is one of three really, really good offensive linemen from the state of Wisconsin this year. He's listed at 6'6, 300 pounds. He's from Milwaukee, goes to Whitefish Bay High School. I love the names of the kids from, from, from Wisconsin. The one kid goes to Whitefish Bay. Uh, Billy Shrouth goes to St. Mary Springs. Carson Hinsman goes to St. Croix. They got some unique names up there in good old Wisconsin. Uh, Joe Bruner is the highest ranked of all the Wisconsin offensive linemen. And I'm curious to get some feedback from you all of, of, of where you think he stacks up once we're done with three offensive linemen from Wisconsin. ESPN ranks him as the number 35 offensive lineman in the in the country, or offense, excuse me, number 35 overall player in the country, number six tackle. Rivals ranks him as the number 58 offensive uh, uh, player in the country, number nine offensive tackle. 24-7 sports ranks him as the number 88 player in the country and the number 11 offensive tackle. And he's a big, strong kid. Let's dive in his film now, and we're going to talk about Joe Bruner. He is also a right tackle. And the first thing that you're going to see when you pop in the film of of Joe Bruner is you're going to see a big, strong kid. Big, strong, physical kid. What I don't know if you're going to see is a guy that, to me, has the athleticism and the flexibility to be a tackle. But you're going to see a lot of this, a lot of him just burying kids. He is a big, physical kid. Already, you know, 
already legit 290, 300 pounds. I think he comes out of his stance pretty well there. He's high, but he moves pretty quickly. Good punch there. Almost like he's throwing a, a hook. I mean, <laughs> he's got a nastiness to him. And I think that's the first thing that stands out to me uh, is he plays with an edge. He plays with a physicality and a nastiness. And the thing I like about this play too, he knocks that guy out, but he doesn't stand over him. He doesn't taunt him. He doesn't. He he keeps looking for work. You knock a guy down, go look for work. And he hits the guy, knocks him out, and he gets his eyes up field, and he's looking for work. Finds another guy to get a hand on. I really like that. Good footwork. You can see he's stepping. He's getting width with that first step. See that? Remember earlier I was talking about how Joey Tonona was kind of not stepping. Watch this left foot by by Joe Bruner. Now, see, this is an instance where I actually don't think Joe Bruner is a, very, is a great athlete. He's very fundamentally sound. And you see that step, bam, and he's got that lead step. So his first two steps, he's he's moving with his first two steps. He's not just staying in place. Gets to that second level, nice base, and just buries the guy. It's a really impressive player. Got good arm length, really good frame. Big, tough, strong kid. I mean, he is he's got a weird body. You can see that he's got a very long torso. And uh and, and, and you can see it in his stance. He's got kind of short legs. And, and he's got a very awkward stance. And he's like I said, he's very oddly built. He's a big, strong kid. Good, you see that arm length? Again, doesn't just hit a guy. He goes looking for work. He's got to seal off that inside gap and goes and finishes the guy off. Really tough physical kid. Again, good step out of his stance, getting upfield quickly. He maximizes the athleticism he does have because of how sound his footwork is. I really like his technique at this point in time. Big, strong kid. Now, my question with Joe Bruner is at this point in time is does he have does he have the athleticism to stick a tackle at the next level? That's my only question for him. Now, that right there is an example of what I'm talking about. See, good technique, but he's a little slow-footed to me once he gets past his first couple steps. And I don't know if he's kind of a guy that you that you that I believe has the kind of the agility and the foot quickness to, to get that one. Now, again, his initial steps is off the line. I like this, right? This is good. But then you kind of get him to the second level, he lumbers a little bit. But he's got a good motor. The kid never stops working. I really like that. Big tough kid, tries to sink his hips. Keeps working his feet through contact. It's a good football player. I just I don't know if he's a tackle. Again, that's my only concern about Joe Bruner. I think he's a really, really good football player. Very oddly built. It's a little bit more film. Very fundamentally sound football player. A really whoever's coaching this kid is is is, is doing a really good job. And it's not just him. I mean, you can watch this whole offensive line. Whoever his high school football coach is, whoever's offensive line coach is, this guy, this guy knows what he's doing. Watch this. He doesn't get caught. He's just working zone. Keep working. Keep working. Find your guy. Know where the back is trying to go. Get that out outside shoulder. So yeah, I mean, I like the fact he puts the guy on the ground. That's all fine and dandy, but I love what he does before that point. Just he knows what he's doing. He's a smart kid, smart football player, fundamentally sound football player, tough football player. The only reason I think he's he, I would not rank him as high as others do, is because I don't think I, I question his athleticism to be a, a dominant top 50, top 75 kind of player at the next level. At Wisconsin, I think he can play tackle. At Notre Dame, I wonder if he might be better off at guard. But as a guard, I see a lot of Tommy Kramer in this kid, but a but a more consistent, fundamentally sound version of Tommy Kramer. And that's a good football player. Look, the reason Tommy Kramer went undrafted, first and the primary reason Tommy Kramer went undrafted is, is injuries. That's a big boy. Joe Bruner, 6'6", 300 pounds. He looks small. That's a massive, massive human being right there that he's going against. Number 99 on that other team. Okay, so this is an example of what I'm talking about. This is a smart, sound football player. So remember earlier, 
I saw how you don't want to get you don't want to turn your hips. So he's working inside. This is he's backside on this play, right? So this is this is a play where he's got to work inside. He gets his hand outside to try to seal that guy off, but he keeps his shoulder square, working up to the next level. This is a really, really fundamentally sound football play, and you can see the hand power there by Joe Bruner. It's very impressive. Again, working inside, he understands angles really, 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 really well. Watch a couple more clips here of Joe Bruner. Good pad level. Never stops his feet. I, I really like this kid. Again, I just I question if his ranking should be where it is because I, I see him more as a guard and I and I don't see him as the kind of athlete. Like when you watch Jake Taylor and you watch Joe Bruner, you see two things that are vastly different. Number one, Joe Bruner's way bigger than Jake Taylor already. Uh, of course, that's sophomore film compared to junior film. The other one is Jake Taylor is a significantly better athlete. And I think that's more of what Notre Dame needs to tackle at, at this point in time. Big, tough kid. And he's got like a 10-minute long highlight tape, and it's all this. I mean, that's what you see from Joe Bruner. It's great fundamentals for that age. It's toughness. It's physicality. It's playing with good angles. It's being well-schooled. It's being patient. It's it's being physical but not out of control. He's a good football player. My concern is, or not my concern, but my observation is, is that I think the ceiling is a little bit lower as a tackle. And, and I think that as he he's a guy that, to me, could he be a Tommy Kramer type of right tackle? Yeah, I think so. Uh, could he? Would he be a very, very good guard? Yeah, I think so. So to me, getting Joe Bruner, it just depends on where you want to play him. If, you, if you're okay with him being an inside guy, great, get him. If you view him as a tackle, there are other guys to me on the board that I like a little bit more. So that's Joe Bruner, again, from Wisconsin. Recruitment-wise, he's going to be at Wisconsin this weekend. He's going to be at Ohio State the following weekend, the 11th to 13th, and then he's going to be at Notre Dame from the 18th to the 20th. I think Notre Dame is in this one, but I think right now Wisconsin is his leader. I think that Notre Dame and Ohio State are both nipping on Wisconsin's heels, but if I had to say which one I think would upset him right now, I'd probably go with Ohio State. But I think Notre Dame is in this one. But but look, all that is just pre-visit. Post-visit whole, could be a whole different story. And this is one of those ones where I think Notre Dame getting his last visit could be a benefit for Notre Dame because you know he'll he'll have that other you know taste in his mouth from those two visits. I think as long as he's not committed somewhere, and I don't I don't anticipate him being committed. I think this is one where Notre Dame could really knock a visit out of the park and be in play for Joe Bruner. But I think of his kind of his top three, which is basically what that was, uh, for which, which what that is for Joe Bruner, I think Notre Dame and Ohio State are kind of lobbying for second place, but the gap between them and, and Wisconsin is, is small. And I think big visits could knock it out of the park. But it, here's the other thing, too, is there's three really good offensive linemen from Wisconsin. Bruner's one, and – there's a chance Wisconsin may not get the other two. And I have a hard time believing that they're going to strike out on all three of those guys. I just have a hard time seeing that. So I think right now Bruner's kind of their best bet. He's also the most highly ranked guy, although I don't necessarily have him there. Uh, and I think Wisconsin's going to certainly put the full court press on him to, to try to get him in the class. And they get first crack at it, but Notre Dame is going to get their opportunity as well. All right, so that's the tackles on the board. Let's dive into the interior players. And there's two guys we're going to spend a lot of time on. Third guy we're just going to watch a little bit of because right now he's on a different level from a, a stamp, standpoint of where he is in the recruitment. First player I want to talk about as from the interior offensive lineman is another Wisconsin player. The next two kids we're going to talk about are Wisconsin players. And that is Billy Shrouth from Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. He goes to St. Mary Springs High School. Listed at 6'5", 285, he is ranked by rivals as the number 114 player in the country, the number two guard. 247 Sports ranks him as the number 173 player in the country, the number seven interior offensive lineman. Let me talk about that here for a second. Two four seven just did a release the other day 
about how they have a, a they're changing some of their positions and they went from you know center and guard to tackle to just a guard you know to to, to interior offensive lineman so tackles and interior offensive lineman I really like that I think that was a smart move I think there's a lot more inter- interchangeableness today in today's game than there was in the past and I think that you know there. The, there's no need to kind of pigeonhole guys into centers and guards, especially since most kids that play center that are projected as centers don't play center in high school. So I really like that move by uh, 247 Sports. I know that we do that at, at, at SI, I'm pretty sure we do that at SIL American as well. I really like that. But they have him as the number seven in tier offensive lineman, which means kind of guards and centers. And then ESPN has him as the number 225 player in the country and the number four guard. I think Rivals is closer to this one. I have Billy as sort of a top 100 to top 120. Actually, I have him kind of a, you know, sort of an 80 to 110, 120 kind of range is where is where his grade fell for me. And this is a kid that I like a lot. Now, I liked Billy Shrouth as a sophomore. I didn't love him as a sophomore. I didn't see as a sophomore a guy that had great athleticism. I saw a big, tough kid, but I didn't necessarily see great athleticism. He's another kid that had a spring season. So Wisconsin didn't allow them to play in the fall, so we didn't get a chance to see much of them. He had a spring season, and I was very, very impressed with what I saw from Billy Shrouse. So let's get his film up on the on the board, and we're going to watch him. So Billy is playing guard for St. Mary Springs. We're going to check out. There's, there's a, He doesn't have like a single highlight film. He's got some game film, so we're going to watch a couple different games of Billy Shrouth. All right. The first thing I like about him is I think he's a really, really quick and explosive off the ball. Very athletic player, especially for 285. I think he moves extremely well. He plays a surprisingly good pad level for a 6'5 kid. He plays against a lot of shorter offensive linemen. I don't think he's as necessarily fundamentally sound as Joe Bruner, but I think athletically I really like what I see from him. And, and the other thing, he's listed at 285. I see a great frame. We get a little high, but watch how he's able to kind of keep his eyes downfield and watch how well he turns up the field here on this pull. This is an impressive play here. He also plays defensive line, and that's where you can really see his athleticism. Really, real. That's actually for an offensive lineman, that's pretty good movement, very good closing speed. He's got very long arms. Now, Billy Strouth is the kind of kid that when I watch him play, he's a guard. I thought as a high school kid, he was a pure guard. But as a junior, he actually showed me some ability that he could potentially play tackle if you needed him to. And I think he's got a little bit better flexibility and foot quickness than Joey Tononen does. So I think between those two guys, if you don't get you know Zach Rice or one of the other tackles, Jake Taylor, he's a kid that I think could have a chance to play tackle with some coaching. I think his issues as far as not being a, a tackle are more about technique than they are anything else. Here he is playing defensive line again. Look at those hands. Really like those hands. Watch how fast they are. Again, he's playing defense here. Really quick hands. He's not a defensive player in college, not at a place like Notre Dame. But I do think he's a kid that being he's a really good high school defensive player. And I think that's something that helps him really be an effective, effective blocker. Let's get this next uh, next clip up here. I don't want to make you guys have to sit through that uh, smokers commercial again. Watch this quickness off the ball. He's playing nose tackle here. Again, I want to see him get the pads a little low, but that is a really good burst off the line. Really good burst off the line. Look at that length. Love that. Now, he doesn't really shoot his hands, just kind of places them, but watch how he locks this guy out. Really like that. Good pad level there. This is the play I was talking about earlier. So he does a decent job of keeping his his shoulders. he, He kind of turns his shoulders just a little bit, but he keeps his hips square. Allows him to quickly get off and get outside to the second level. That's a really 
Really good play, good instincts there, and, and good athleticism. But I really like this kid's burst off the line. I like his natural power. I think as he continues to fill out and adds more strength and weight room strength and then adds about another 15 or 20 pounds, which I think is what he can get up to, he's got a really impressive 285-pound body. But again, that's good quickness, good pad, good pad, not great, but good pad level off the ball, really quick off the ball. He's a really good athlete, in my opinion, and I've really been impressed with just that that burst that I see from him. Now, again, I'm projecting a little bit to the offensive tackle part of whether or how I could play it, but you know, because he's a he's a guard in high school. But I, I think that there are some traits there that make me think he could have a shot to play that position. And a lot of it is about what he does on defense because you see him in space a little bit more. I'm just going to watch a little bit of him because I don't want to click through eight different games. We're just going to watch a little bit of a little bit of his highlights. But look how quick he gets off the ball here. He's a left guard again, just explodes off the ball. And he's up in that guy's chest before that guy's barely out of his stance. And then they're just they're run, third down. They're just running a little quick dive right behind him. That is an impressive, impressive block right there. Got to learn to, he's got to learn to use his hands better, but I think he has strong hands from what I can see. I just want to see him learn to use them. Like Jake Taylor kind of overdoes it a little bit. Billy doesn't use them much at all the way that I want. But just watch how, I mean, these guys are like not prepared for him. Like they're barely out of their stance and he's already up in, under their pads and just driving them off the ball. This is really, really good quickness. Now you could argue that maybe he's just a tad out of control as far as like a little bit too much forward lean. And against a better defensive lineman, they may kind of make him miss there. But you can te- you can coach that up. What you can't coach up is just the attitude, the demeanor, and the quickness with which he gets off the ball. But the other thing, too, is this is great balance. Because actually, if you watch it here, and I'm going to try to stop it right when I want. So he's leaning a little bit too much there, right? A little bit too much of a forward lean. But he doesn't fall down because he's got very, very good balance. He's able to cover and just put that guy on the ground. It's a really impressive play there by Billy Shrouth. Just the last couple of clips here, and then we're gonna be we're gonna be done with Billy. It's a really nice, really nice pad level, much and and much better control there. So you see how he's not as forward of a lean. So like this play, he's got a he's got a little bit better leverage. So he gets low, right? So you can see he's underneath this guy. He's he's the low man off the ball, but his back isn't as flat. Like you want a nice flat back in your stance, but he kind of sometimes will lean and keep that back flat. And that's when he gets a little bit too much of a forward lean. This is much better right here. It's a really nice play from Billy Shrouth. And that's going to be it of the film that we're going to watch of Billy Shrouth. And then, then we're going to watch a little bit of Carson Hensman here. So let's talk a little bit about Billy Shrouth and where his recruitment is right now. So Billy has a schedule visit a visit scheduled on June 4th for Wisconsin. He has a visit scheduled for June 15th to Ohio State. And then that is kind of a midweek visit. And then he has a visit for Notre Dame on the 18th. Uh, I am extremely confident in where Notre Dame stands on this one. I'm not concerned much at all about the the two schools ahead of him. I think this is one that has been trending in Notre Dame's favor for a very, very long time. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that one. But I I believe of all the offensive linemen in this class, this is the one that I am absolutely most confident in when it comes to Notre Dame being able to, to close the deal. And then, so what would a guy like Billy Shrouth add to the class? I think he's athletic. He'd be the he, very athletic player, very physical player. And I think he's got some versatility that I like. As I mentioned, he's a guard right now. I can see him playing center. He's also a guy that I think if if you if you like, you know, you have Blake Fisher who Blake Fisher's a freshman. You have Tosh Baker, who's technically a freshman when you consider he's got a COVID year. You could take some time with Billy if you wanted to bump him out to tackle. If you're like, hey, look, we love his athleticism. We think with some work he could be a tackle for us. I, I'd be okay with that if you miss on some other guys. I'd like to see them get a Jake Taylor, and then you can keep Billy inside. But I do think he brings some versatility to the table that I really like. Uh, he'd be a great, great addition for Notre Dame. And as I said, he's sort of a top 80 to 110 to 120 kind of player on, on my board. So he is a very, very talented football player.
I've been doing a lot of talking today, so my voice is getting a little, or my th my throat's getting a little bit dry, so I apologize for the constant need to have to pound water. But I've been talking a lot today. So next, let's talk about Carson Hensman. Carson Hensman is a 6'4", 275 to 280 pound offensive lineman from Hammond, Wisconsin. He goes to St. Croix High School. Rivals has him ranked as the number 100, as the number 82 player in the country, the number one center. 247 Sports has him ranked number 162, the number six interior offensive lineman. ESPN has him ranked number 187, number three guard. For me, Carson is kind of in between Rivals and 247. I think the reason I have him ranked a little bit lower than Billy Shrouth right now is simply because I think his body just needs a little bit more room to grow. But it's it's like a, just a point or two difference between those two. I think Carson is a kid that you're going to see on film plays guard in high school, but he's a guy that I think could play guard or center at the next level. And the thing I, I noticed about him is I had a chance to see Carson this summer at the Columbus camp, and he, he, he measured in at 275 pounds. But what stood out to me was he has sort of a Liam Eikenberg type of body. And what I mean by that is he's, there's, he's just not, he's not fat at all. He's a really well-built kid. Uh, he is a guy, <laughs> sorry, Omar, that might be my favorite, favorite comment that anybody's put up in a while. Uh, but uh, when I look at Carson Hensman, he's got broad shoulders, kind of a big head, uh, big hands, big feet. You know, really thick kind of country boy core, but he's not fat at all. He's got a really good frame, which what that tells me is there's room for him to put on a lot of weight. He's going to fill out up here. His arms aren't that big right now, which means there's a lot of room to fill out there. He's a kind of that, that mid core areas. Again, a lot of room for him to develop. But what I like about him is he's not a kid that you look at and say, You've got to reshape his body. You've got to get some fat off. No, if anything, you got to add weight to him because again, he's only 280 pounds, but it's going to be good weight because he's got a really good. Again, I say this and I mean this kind of as a compliment, but just what you expect to see from that that midwestern kid, you know, where he's just not fat. He's just a big, thick kid, broad-shouldered kind of kid, and that's what I see from from Carson Hensman. So I like his frame better than you might think from a guy that that is listed that way. And the other thing I noticed is for an interior player, he's got pretty long arms. And that's something I noticed about him too. So I, I kind of view him as in a similar sort of 90 to 120 range. So just a step below Billy Shrouth, but the ceiling is just as high, in my opinion. I just think Carson, you know, where, where Billy's like 285, 290, Carson's like 275, 280. Billy's a little bit more ready to play today, where Carson would need a little bit more time in the weight room wherever he goes. But as far as once they both reach their peak, very, very similar grades, almost indistinguishable grades. So let's dive a little bit into Carson Hensman. Uh, Carson is a kid that you're going to see here playing guard. He's projected to be a guard or a center at the next level. I really like the idea of him kind of being Notre Dame's next center. What you're going to see here, too, is the reason I think he's a guard is interior player is, and you can see in these frame, he's got long arms. But he's kind of got that squatty kind of build, you know, that lower to the ground build. He's got a natural base to him that I love from interior players. Just look at him working to the second level here. He's just naturally balanced, natural base, naturally plays low. And he's always, I mean, he's always low. I love it. Look at that foot quickness, though. He's, you know, you can just watch a guy and you just see it. He's just athletic. That's what I see from Carson. Now, there's some times where technique wise, he gets in trouble, and, and this happened at the at the Under Armour camp where his technique got him in a little bit of trouble, but athletically he's really outstanding. Moves his feet extremely well. Again, that just picks his left foot up and puts it down, doesn't really gain any ground there, but you can just see the quickness off the ball, the natural pad level with which he plays the game, just a really drives his feet through contact. This is another example of what I'm talking about, just working his feet through contact. I love watching this kid block. Again, look at that naturally low build. He's at least six three and a half. I mean, I stood next to him and I interviewed him. He's at least I had to look up at him. I'm six feet tall. I had to look up at him. He's at least six three and a half. So he's got some good height. He's just got that real squatty, naturally low build. Now, again, I don't want to see this. Like technically, I don't want to see this. 
I want to see you engage and stay blocked on a guy. But I love the toughness that he shows. He plays with an edge. I really like that edge. This is a really athletic play. He's not able to overcome the guy. You know, you want to see him finish that off. This is a footwork thing, but look how quickly he gets to that guy's outside, overtakes him, and then just pushes him up the field, gets great movement, and then just buries the guy in the end zone. It's a really impressive play there by Carson. And as you're going to see, there's some fundamental things that he can he needs to work on footwork-wise, hand placement-wise, but the athleticism and the pad level and the bend are just excellent. Really, really impressive. And he plays... He plays kind of, you know, it, it's funny is when I met him, he's this really nice, polite, um, well-spoken, well-mannered kid, doesn't have a real loud voice. I mean, he's not shy by any means. I mean, he's engaging and all that, but he's just a real polite kid. But then you watch him on film and there's nothing polite about this kid. I mean, <laughs> he's got a little bit of an edge to him. And I, and I really like, I mean, look at that power. Again, that's not great technique. That's not a play that I'm putting on my teaching tape from a technique standpoint, but that's a play I'm, I'm looking at. I'm saying, boy, this kid's got some edge to him. Gets up, keeps looking for work. I want to see a little bit better balance there. Really like this kid. Good athlete, gets low, quick on traps and pulls. Really fast hands. I mean, just, I mean, he's just punching guys out. I mean, I mean, are you seeing this? Like he's 275 pounds. He's hit like, like five knockout blows so far. Again, not great technique, but what it tells you is he's got great hands, fast hands. He's got the fastest hands I've seen on film so far, but he's got really, really impressive punch. That shock value when he gets, you see what I'm saying? Like that's, that's kind of a borderline dirty play there. But he's just going to keep playing. He doesn't taunt the guy. He just goes back to his to huddle. But I love the I love the edge that this kid plays with. He is really feisty. You would not know it if you met him as a super polite kid. But when that helmet goes on, he is mean. And I love it. I'm here for all of it. Always looking for work. Always hunting for work. I, I like that. Again, good patience. He's just again a lot to clean up technically. And and that's where that's where you look at and say, you know, you get you get him to Notre Dame, they're gonna work with him, they're gonna really coach him up, but he's got a lot to work with. Love the feet, love the bend, love the pad level, love the punch, love the toughness, love the strength. He's just got to add some weight and he's got to clean up his technique. But there's a lot to like about Carson Hinsman on film. And it's just look now, that's what I'm talking about. So what he's gonna hit this guy, watch how quickly. Keeps his he keeps his shoulders basically square, knocks that guy inside, but he's got his eyes up. Watch him find that stunt. So this is a linebacker coming from the second level. He's going to stun outside. Carson gets right to him, picks it up, and just drills it. That is really really well done there. Really well done there. It's kind of like we're watching the same clip over and over again because he's just he's just the same guy every play. Just real quick off the ball, finishing, knocking guys down. I mean, again, these aren't big guys, but goodness gracious, he's just punching guys down on every single play. That that's really good hand power right there. Good patience. Another guy on the ground. But it's putting guys on the ground under control. That's it. He's not throwing guys. And I hate I hate when offensive linemen throw guys because you're going to throw a guy right into your your teammate and tear his knee up. I, I don't want to see that. Keeps that good pad level. It's a trap block. Drives the guy upfield. Finishes him off. It's another impressive play. All right, last clip of Carson Hinsman. Uh, that wasn't a great one. So let's, oh, a little bit of defense. That's right. Let's get a couple clips of this. You can just kind of see him playing defense. You can see that toughness and that attitude, that quickness. This is this is a fun football player. This is one of my favorite kids on film. There's no question about it. And I think he fits what Notre Dame is looking for, too. They, he's, he's got that edge, that demeanor. He's a bit of a brawler, but he's athletic. That's the thing. He's athletic. Notre Dame needs athletic players. 
He's the kind of guy that has the foot quickness and the arm length that he can snap that ball to this. To, and this is why I like him as center. He's got a long arm, so he can kind of snap that ball, but then he's got the length to really extend and protect the A-gaps. There's a lot of times people will put their kind of short, squatty, short-armed guys as center. I like a center with some arm length. And that's the reason I really like Carson Hensman as, as a potential center for Notre Dame because he's got really good arm length for an interior player, which means he can really do a great job of protecting those A-gaps. Really impressive player. So that's Carson Hensman. So let's talk about Carson Hensman's recruitment. He's got four visits scheduled so far. He's moved some things around. He was originally going to go to Wisconsin and Iowa, um, and then Notre Dame, and then Alabama, and then Penn State. What's well, moved around a little bit, Ohio State has gotten in the mix. So he's going to still visit Wisconsin on June 4th. He's going to then visit Ohio State on the 11th. Ohio State has gotten involved lately, and they're really turning up the heat on Carson Hensman, and, and they're, 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 they're battling. So he's obviously committed to going on a visit there. So they have to be looked at as a player. He went to Bama on June 1st. He was at Bama yesterday on an unofficial visit. So he went to Bama unofficially now instead of the official visit. Then he's got Notre Dame on the 20, on the 18th, and then he's got Iowa the following weekend. And really, to me, I, I think Bama's in it, but to me, it's more of a Wisconsin-Iowa battle and then now Ohio State. Now, Notre Dame has done a great job in this recruitment. They've done, I mean, in regards to having a long-established relationship with him, now it's about being able to close, and it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a lot tougher to close on him than it is for Billy Shroud, for example. You know, Wisconsin, obviously, is going to be a player for him. He really likes that staff. Uh, oh, he's had a lot of great things to say about Iowa. That's a good staff he likes. And then, of course, Ohio State is Ohio State. And so Notre Dame's going to have their hands full uh, to get Carson Hinsman, but they're in they're in the battle. They have to have a knockout visit. He's been to Notre Dame before, but this is going to be his first time as a as a you know as a full blown recruit. And so I think that he is a, a guy that when I look at him, I say, could Notre Dame get him? Would I be shocked if Notre Dame got him? No. And I like where Notre Dame is at right now. But to me, he's also a kid that I think that other schools are, are – If it, let's just say Notre Dame is his leader, and I don't think that he has a leader right now, but let's just say Notre Dame was. I think the the gap between Notre Dame and those other schools is is, is like this. And so I think that it, it, a lot of this for him is going to be about the visits. I think the visits are going to tell us everything about where things stand with Carson Hensman. Notre Dame's got to knock it out of the park. They, they've got to blow him up. I mean, they've got to just – I mean, make him feel the love and just show him how he fits in the system uh, and, and really just be able to find ways to separate from those other programs because he's he's looking at some really good offensive line schools and Notre Dame needs to be able to get him. I I think in a perfect world, if, if I'm looking at Notre Dame and saying, what's the ideal close, you know, what's the ideal class? To me, Billy Shrouth and Carson Hinsman are part of that. You know, if you can get those two kids and then, you know, maybe get a Jake Taylor, maybe a Joe Bruner, that's a heck of a class. But I really feel like they have to have Shrouth and Hensman because one of the things that I haven't loved about some of the interior players in Notre Dame has gotten in recent seasons. Uh, you look at Bat Coogan and and some of those guys, and I'm not talking about Rocco because Rocco's a beast, but but there's been some interior players that are big, strong kids, but not overly athletic kids. The thing I like about Shrouth and Hensman is they're very athletic. And so I I want those two guys more than anything because I, I think they need an upgrade in athleticism inside. And I think those two players bring that. I think if Notre Dame is going to be running the zones and the outside zones, the inside zones, the counters and things like that, which is really their bread and butter, they need athletic players, but they need physical athletic players. And so that's why I think is even though those kids are from Wisconsin, I think Billy Shrout and Carson Hensman are tailor-made for the Notre Dame offense. And so now it's for Notre Dame. It's about, you got to close. If you're Jeff Quinn and you want to, you want to get people to stop talking about Harry, he stand. Okay. Here's how you do it. You get Billy Shrouth to commit after his visit on the 18th, you seal the deal with Carson Hensman, and then you overcome Oklahoma for Jake Taylor. To me, that's how you say, okay, you know, maybe we got to see if he's the coach that Harry, he stand was, but no more questions about recruiting. That's the elite, elite offensive line haul. To be able to go into the state of Wisconsin, and Wisconsin produces big-time offensive lines, be able to go into that state and get two of those three kids is big time. To be able to overcome Oklahoma and get a guy like Jake Taylor is big time. But that's what you need to do. That's what I think Harry Heastan would do. 
now that now we need to see if if Jeff Quinn can do that. It's a tremendous opportunity for him to really make his bones as a recruiter. You could look at last year and you know he got Zach, you know, Blake Fisher, but I mean Blake Fisher was just he was gonna go to Notre Dame. Rocco Spindler you know, was had been a, a Notre Dame lean for some time. I think he did a great job there, but I, I think these are a little tougher sells than those two were. So if he can knock this class out of the park and get those two kids from Wisconsin and then get Jake Taylor, to me, that's an offensive line class that with Tonona and Shan, I'll put against anybody from a recruiting standpoint. And it's exactly the kind of class that Notre Dame needs to ensure that their talent level moving forward on the offensive line remains at an elite level. That is exactly what Notre Dame needs to do. Now, there's a couple other guys on the board that I that I'm not going to talk. We're not going to watch film of Ryan Bear. Uh, it's still early in his recruitment. I don't think Notre Dame is necessarily pushing for him. I think that's more of a get another kid on the board in case you miss this summer. You need to have some some backup plans. I don't know if he's a guy that they're that they're looking at as a as a push. I had a chance to see him at Columbus as well. He's a big, strong kid. I don't think he's quite as big as, as, as I've seen one place list him at six, eight. He didn't look that tall to me. He's a big country boy, really talented football player. I just don't, I don't know if he's like a Notre Dame level guy. He's definitely not a Notre Dame level guy as a tackle in my opinion, but I think that's more about just making sure that your board is protected at this point in time. So, and the other guy I didn't talk about is Emil Wagner. Here's the reason I didn't talk about Emil Wagner. He's going to Ohio State. I mean, I don't think anybody in the planet is thinking he's going to go anywhere else. I'm not stealing the kid's moment. I mean, that's just – that's where everybody thinks. I believe he visits Ohio State this weekend. If he comes out of that visit uncommitted, then we can talk about him. Okay? We, we'll have a chat about it. But I just – I don't see that happening. And I think Notre Dame knows that. I think Notre Dame is uh, is aware that they had a good shot with him to begin with, but now that Ohio State's in the mix, it's it's that's where he's going to go. Here's my other thing with Emil Wagner. I think Emil's a very intriguing prospect. Number one, I don't think he's as good as Jake Taylor. But number two, my big concern with Emil is he's got a bit of a skinny lower body, and I don't know how effectively he's going to be able to get to the weight that he needs to get to and be able to maintain the athleticism. I, I have questions about, I mean, love is toughness, is athleticism, all those things are there. But can he get up to 300 pounds and play at 300 pounds? I have a little bit more of a question on that. So that's where we are with the Notre Dame board. And we broke down the film. We looked at the guys that they like. I think you all know, have an idea of what I want to see happen in this class. Now we need to figure out that, you know, what Notre Dame's going to be able to actually do. I, I have my sort of my dream class that I think would be an absolute home run for Notre Dame. Now it's up to Jeff Quinn and Tommy Reese and that staff to make it to get it done. But that's the Notre Dame offensive board. So let's get up here. Some of the questions at the very beginning aren't there. So the first question that I have is from Timothy D. Let me go ahead and I'm going to look over here on the uh, the YouTube channel and I'm going to see if the earlier questions are in there. So just give me a second because I don't want to miss some of the questions. Uh, there. So let me try to see if some of those early questions are on still in the chat. So doesn't look like they are there. All right. So there are some questions early on that, that doesn't look like we were able to get to. And I apologize. So if you have a question and you asked it before this one from Timothy, please submit it again because it just, they only can handle so many qu questions and I wasn't able to go all the way back up to the top. Uh, so Timothy D asks, Brian, can you explain what makes Joe Moore and Harry He stand great line coaches? What part does teaching technique play? What part does intensity play? How can a line coach be evaluated? I think that's a great question. I think for me, the great coaches can do three things extremely well, and they kind of go hand in hand. The first two go hand in hand. Can you be a great technician? And can you teach players toughness and physicality? I think that's kind of number one. And some coaches have trouble with doing both. Some coaches are good at teaching technique, but not technique while maintaining a playing with force. I think that's an issue that I think believe Jeff Quinn has. Or they may be fundamentally sound, 
but they're not fundamentally sound with force. And 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 th- you need to be able to do both. I think the other part is then can you can you teach players to be assignment correct? Assignment correct isn't just about knowing who to block. It's knowing how to block them. And not from a technique standpoint. That's part of it, but more of it's the angles, it's the in- instincts, it's the the timing of when to get off certain blocks, it's those type of things. I think another thing that offensive line coaches have to do is they have to be able to is, is get the most out of their players. And that has to happen in a lot of different ways. Some guys can teach technique. They can teach assignment correctness, but for whatever reason, they're just not able to get that intensity, that focus, that that just getting the guy to just submit. Coach, I'd run through a wall for you. Get that trust. And and the, to establish that trust to where if I tell you to do something, you're going to just do it because I said it. That's the kind of trust you have in me. And I think that's something that Jeff Quinn is still trying to establish with his linemen. I don't think that's always there right now. But I think that's the thing that I see is, is just to be able to play with physicality and sound technique and assignment correctness, but getting guys to just play with a passion for you, but more importantly, a passion for each other. That's the final piece is great online coaches – our guys can get that. It's like a ballet, right? A ballet is like all types of different people doing different things, but it's as one harmonious activity. It all flows together. Offensive linemen have to be like that. It can't be five offensive linemen. It has to be one offensive line. And that, to me, is one of the hardest things that that offensive line coaches do is the great coaches are able to get them all playing together as one unit. And it's just – the communication, the technique, the timing, all of it just flows perfectly. And those are the things that I do when I evaluate is technique, toughness. Do you take the fight to your opponents? Uh, do you have one guy making a mistake all the time, one different guy making a mistake all the time? Uh, that, to me, is an example of a guy that doesn't have a group of guys playing together. Are they all coming off and playing with force? That's the question that you have to ask. Joseph Juan asks a good question. I've heard you talk about how the problem with Jeff Quinn is that is that he teaches to catch instead of exploding off the line. I've also heard that he recruits bigger, smaller types of guards. And then he says, don't those things contradict each other? No, because you can have a type, but then not know how to coach that type to play to its full potential, which kind of leads back to that question that I answered for Timothy. I think he likes the squattier, the the, the physical, the tough kind of kids. But then when you get him there, if you're not teaching them to play, and again, it's not teaching them to catch. I don't think Jeff Quinn teaches them to catch. It's a byproduct of how he teaches, and that is the players. This is this is so. What I'm going to tell you right now is not for me. This is a criticism that I've heard from sources over the last few years. It's there's not a lot of confidence that they're prepared for what they're going to see. They they've had too many times at Notre Dame where. The opponent was doing things early on that they just weren't prepared for. They didn't practice for. Not watching as much film and a lot of individual technique, but not nearly enough game prep to the point where in years past, when certain players got hurt, they were the ones leading the offensive lineman through film. That's happened twice. And and I think that's part of it to where it's like, you're not going to come off and explode off the ball if you're hesitant and unsure of who you're supposed to block. And I think the other part of it is, the technique aspect of it is not all coaches are good at teaching you to to play as one. So we'll see Notre Dame in practice work on these two man blocks where they just work and drive forward. And it's a it's a technique that he it's a drill that 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 Harry Heastan did right. And you just work together in a combo and you just drive that guy ten yards down the field. And that's fine. But then when they get together and it's one five man group, they don't play like that because they're not taught all the different ways as a whole unit to play that way. I think another challenge for offensive line coaches is can you teach them to be physical in the run game yet patient and and not passive, but patient in the pass game. And I think that's where Jeff Quinn struggles is, is there've always been a pretty good pass blocking offensive line, but to then get them to, to that patient, but then on run plays to be physical, that's been a struggle. And that's the thing that I want to see from coach Quinn this year is, now that Chris Watts gone and Harry he stands all of Harry he stands recruits and the guys that Harry he stand coached and worked with now that they're all gone can you continue that physical style of play that we saw last year if you can then we're gonna be fine but if not then you're gonna see this line take a, a bigger step back than 
than what they should. So here's some questions. I think some of these we answered as, as we went through it. Chris Ayer says, what are your thoughts on Zach Rice? Is he better than Blake Fisher? Rice would seem to need at least 10 to 15, 15 to 20 pounds to do his frame. And, and that, could that change his performance? I think you saw in that, that junior film that he's, he's a 300 pounder. He doesn't need to add a lot of weight. Uh, to me, I, I think Blake Fisher is a bit much better prospect than Zach Rice, in my opinion. Joseph Juan asks, is foot quickness a trait that is mostly God-given or can it be improved on in college? Foot quickness, Joseph, is something that to a degree is God-given, but it is also something that may be improved. I mean, that's what strength conditioning programs are for is to improve your, your explosiveness, your foot quickness, your speed, your conditioning. All of those things can be improved. Having said that, you're not going to be a slow-footed guy and then you spend a couple years with Chris Bayless, Matt Bayless, and all of a sudden, you're running a 3-9 shuttle. That's just not happening. You can get quicker, but you're never going to be a super quick guy. So it begins with being God-given, and then it just gets down to how much can a, coach, can a strength coach maximize that ability. All right, Kai S. says, I do not understand the immense amount of love for Rice and Cyrus. I'm happier with the 2-0 line that we currently have. Who is Cyrus? Do you mind letting me know who that is? I'm not quite sure who that is, uh, unless you're talking about Cyrus Moss on the defensive line. But, uh, look, I think Zach Rice is a very good football player. I think he's a top 100 player, but I agree. I, I don't think he's quite the player that, that people make him out to be. And Kenny Moore says, I, I think Rice has superstar written all over him. Bama is going all out for the kid. I, I get that, but I don't know if that's necessarily – Bam has been kind of hit or miss depending on who their offensive line coach is on targeting the right players. They also went all out for Emil Echior, and I don't think he's that great of a player either. Coleman, we answered the question about where things stand with Joe Bruner. Let's see if we got some more questions here. Kai says, I think Joey and Ty have a nasty approach to blocking similar to Blake. Bama is the system, which is why most of the O-line and running backs do not have great NFL careers. I would somewhat agree with that. I think some of their offensive linemen are decent players, but yeah, I, I think that their style is just big physical guys. They're not overly athletic guys in a lot of instances, and I do think at, at times the Bama guys are um, are um, a little overrated. It, Kenny Moore, I mean, you're my guy, Kenny, but we're going to have to disagree on this one. You give me a choice between Fisher and Rice, I take Rice. I think Fisher might be a better guard where Rice is 100% of tackle. See, I don't agree with that, Kenny. I think that Blake Fisher is a better tackle. At the same at the same age, not even just now, but at the same age, I think Blake Fisher was more of a, a tackle because he's longer. It's a lot, lo a lot longer than Zach Rice. I think my issue with Zach Rice is not only is he not an elite athlete, I don't think he's super long. I really don't love Zach Rice as a tackle. I think he could be a really good guard, but I I think Blake Fisher's bigger. He's longer. He's a better athlete, and to me, he you know he he he's not as dominant from the standpoint of he doesn't throw guys around like Zach Rice does. But he was a to me, a better football player at the same age. Let's see if we get some other questions down here. Again, I don't care too much about competition. I think you can you can you can see what a guy is doing. You can evaluate what a guy is doing. Boy, a lot of con I love the chat that was going on here. I'm, I'm having trouble finding questions because you guys are so are talking so much, and I absolutely love that. That's what I want. I want you guys to be engaging. It's all respectful. It's disagreement. It's people making their opinions. Absolutely, absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. That's what I want to do here. Okay, let's see. But we do need some questions if we get through here. So Kai says, I'd prefer Indy finish with Jake. Talking about Jake Taylor, I agree. I agree. I think he's he's outstanding. Would love to get him. A lot of comments from there. Chris Ayer says, what position to project him at at the next level, right or left tackle? Um, I think he can play left tackle. I think Jake Taylor has the athleticism and length to play left tackle. I think he can play right tackle. I think he's one of those guys that's interchangeable. Uh, I think he's going to probably be two years behind Blake Fisher, So I meaning I think he's going to be – in the 22 class, which means he's a year behind. But Jake's a redshirt guy, so I think he'll be a redshirt freshman Blake when Blake Fisher's a junior. 
And I think Blake Fisher is a three-year player at Notre Dame. Barring injury, I think he's a three-year player. So I could see a guy like him stepping in the left tackle, but I could also see him being a right tackle and Tosh Baker taking over. I could see Tosh earning the right tackle job in 22. And then if Blake leaves, you know, after 23, Tosh flies over to left tackle and Jake steps in at right tackle. I think he can play both. I think he's an outstanding, outstanding football player. Chris Ayers asks, typically don't you put your better run blocker on the right side and pass protector on the left side? Typically, yeah, Chris, but that's that's not as important nowadays as it used to be because of the shotgun. You know, it, the, the the advent of the shotgun has really helped neutralize the need for a, a pure left tackle because of the, the, you know, when you're under center, the first step as a quarterback, it's here. And you're getting with and you can't necessarily see behind you. In the shotgun, you're kind of stepping here and you can kind of see more. So you still want to have your best pass blocker there at left tackle if it's preferred, but I don't think you have to have that. It's not the need that it used to be. And, and even in a Notre Dame offense where they go under center a little bit more at some other schools, I, I don't think it's necessarily needed. And I think the whole put your best run blocker right tackle thing is definitely, definitely gone. I think ideally you really need good pass blockers on both sides of the line. You're going to probably put your longer or more athletic player at left tackle just because there still is a bit of a blind side type of feel to that. It's not as much as it used to be, but it is still there on anything longer than a, you know, a three-step drop from the gun. So I think ideally you would, you'd like to, to have your better pass blocker, the left tackle. But, but I think nowadays it, you need really better pass blockers on both sides. A lot of love for Jake Taylor. And, yes, Kenny, uh, Oklahoma is a team to beat for him. We talked about that. But I think that Notre Dame has a chance to to really to really take off. And I think Chris asked this, how many more Notre Dame O-line are collecting NFL paychecks in Oklahoma? Oklahoma's done a really good job in recent seasons of producing NFL players. Their, their offensive line coach, I think it's Bill Bedenball, I think is his name. I, I could be wrong. I forget his last name. But he's a heck of an offensive line coach. After the 2018 season, they lost four offensive linemen. Four, all four of them got drafted in the first four rounds. He's done a really, really excellent job, in my opinion. Um, Kai says this. Uh, Kai S says, if I had to pick where, I would say that Jake is headed to Oklahoma, but he fits better, Notre Dame better. I agree with that. I agree with that. This is a great comment uh, Shinji makes. Fisher greater than every 2022 O-line prospect. He is right now because he's older than all of them. But, you know, right now I think that the only guy that – the only tackle that I would say I would even think could compete with Blake Fisher when it's all said and done would be Jake Taylor. That that would be it. But they'd be different players, different kind of players. Sid Iris says, I'll take Shrouth and Hensman. I agree. I think those two guys are must-gets for Notre Dame in this class. Absolute, absolute must-gets. Kai, really low on Zach Rice. He says, I'd take jo uh, Joe Bruner before Rice. Just my opinion from watch tape on both. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one. Brandon asked me a question here. Brian, have you broken down fil any film of Penn State verbal commit Drew Shelton? Notre Dame has been trying to get him on campus. Would love to have him if Notre Dame can't secure Taylor. Looks like an impact talent at, at uh, tackle. I like Drew Shelton a lot. Notre Dame was on him very early during his sophomore year. He committed to Penn State early. I don't see him decommitting from Penn State. I, I just don't. I think that Notre Dame can try, but I, I like that Notre Dame's not giving up. I love that. I just That one's going to be tough. That one's going to be tough. Uh, but, yeah, he's an athletic player. He's, he's an interesting kid because as a sophomore, and that was most of the film I'd watched until recently, as a sophomore, I thought Drew was an athletic kid, but he was kind of built more like a guard. Like He was kind of like a, a, a little pudgier kid. He kind of built low to the ground. He's kind of built like a guard, but he's got really good length, and he's really athletic. So I think he can definitely play. I think he's definitely a tackle. He just kind of looks like a guard, if I'm, if I'm making any sense there. But no, he's a very athletic kid, really strong hands. It's a good football player. It's a really good pickup for Penn State. If Notre Dame gets him on campus, we'll talk about him. But I don't, I don't see that one happening, to be honest with you. Call San 22. I'm hoping I'm saying that right. I apologize if I'm not. Which guy does Notre Dame have a better chance at landing the commitment uh, for Taylor or Hinsman? Uh, I think Hinsman right now is who they have a better shot with. Uh, I'd like to see him get both. Taylor's a tackle. Hinsman's an inside guy, but right now I'd say they have a better shot with Hinsman than they do Taylor. 
Brandon gives his opinion. My order of tackle prospects, one Rice, two Taylor, three Shelton, four Bruner, five Wagner. Uh, Jake Taylor's my number one. No question about it. I agree with you on Wagner just because I have those question marks about him being able to play. Um, you know, I'd have to I'd have to think about Rice and Shelton. I'd have to think about that one. I, I'd have Bruner lower because I think Bruner to me is has a higher has a higher floor but a lower ceiling than a lot of those guys because I just don't think he's a great athlete. I think he's more of a guard, but he's a really really good football player. Chris Ayers asks, if you had to rank the three kids from Wisconsin, what order would you put them in as far as what would be the best for Notre Dame? So it, it's the same as it's the same as their actual ranking. So I've graded all these guys out, and Shrouth graded out the highest. Hinsman was right behind him. I think it was, I think it was like maybe like two points out of hundreds. It was like two points. And then uh Bruner's third. And I think that's the order I think of importance for Notre Dame. And it's it's that's how I would rank it. I, I think that that's a must get for them. Uh, S says, Coach, I remember when uh, this would be Jamori Sawyer from Oklahoma was a prospect. He seemed like a can't miss, and I think you were high on him as well. Career hasn't seemed to pan out. Uh, our offensive lineman, the hardest project. Uh, he's actually a pretty good football player. He just took a little bit longer to get going because they had an older group, but uh, he I believe he started for Georgia last year. Let me look that up real quick. And he's definitely he's definitely projected to start this year, but I, I believe that Jamori started for them last year. He was one of their younger players. I'm going to look that up real quick. So just give me a second, real fast. Yeah. So I he he played 630 663 snaps last year, and according to Pro Football Focus, he was their highest graded offensive lineman. He graded out at 81.2. Uh, to put that in perspective, and that was um, that was yeah overall grade 81.2. To put that into perspective. If you look at Notre Dame's offensive linemen, they they were gonna they're gonna grade out higher. But Ian Meikenberg was at eighty nine point nine, Hainsey was eighty nine point six, and then Aaron Banks was eighty one point three. So according to Pro Football Focus, again take it for what it's worth, uh, Jarrett Patterson was eighty one point seven. Jamori Sawyer graded out higher than than Jarrett Patterson and Aaron Banks. Now I or actually right around there he was eighty one point two. So I don't know. I couldn't tell you th if that. Sh spot on accurate or not because I didn't I didn't watch a ton of Jamori but I liked what I saw from him uh when I when I watched Swords of Play they had him playing tackle I, I you know I still wonder if he might he better be might be a better guard but not uh, Jamori was a good player for them last year and he's he's back he's considered one of the better offensive linemen in the SEC I believe hold on let me look I got my Athlon sports here I'm always ready always ready to talk about different things but I thought I saw him as a a, a preseason all SEC player According to Athlon, so let me just let me just look here real quick. Oh, Pac-12. Why do we have the Pac-12? We need to put the Pac-12 at the back of the magazine, in my opinion. Yeah, Athlon has him as a preseason first-team All SEC player. So uh, I think he's pan I think he's turned out to be a pretty good football player. Now, will he be a top ten NFL draft pick like he was ranked? I don't know. He's a pretty good football player. Uh, S asks, has Quinn Carroll fully recovered from that knee injury? Pre-injury, I thought he would be an impact player so far. He does not seem like he uh, will follow that trajectory. He doesn't look to be 100% healed from that, and, and I don't know if he ever will be because Quinn was always a guy that could not afford to lose a step, and he looks sluggish still. We saw it in practice videos. We saw it in the Blue Gold game. I don't know if he's going to get that back or not, and that's a concern I have. I think he's a really – physical kid he's a tough kid he's a fundamentally sound kid i think he's a guy that this next year is going to be important for him if he doesn't really get that mobility back between now and next fall then then i'm just i don't know if it's going to be there but he had a really bad knee injury omar austin this is the comment i laughed at he said this is when i said that you know my voice is kind of my mouth is getting really dry and getting a little bit hoarse from all the talking i've done today keep that motor mouth coming i i don't know whether to be offended or to say thank you, or a little bit of both, but uh, I'm glad you're here for it, my man. I really appreciate that. Uh, let's see here. Some more questions. Kai says, Taylor Hensman and Billy Shrouth in order. That's my picks for the O-line finish. I, that's my three. I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. Chris Ayer says, hunting for work. That's the term I was looking for when watching tape on rice yeah I, I yeah because he he doesn't often do that he kind of knocks the guy down and kind of taunts the guy and stays on him yeah I, I get exactly what you're saying okay
All right, going to see if we have any more questions here. Christopher says, how does Carmody compare to Strouth and Hensman? Uh, I, he did not grade as high. Michael was a bit of a late bloomer. He came out as a senior. I don't think he's as athletic with as those other two players, in my opinion. He is, however, a longer, bigger than those two guys. But uh, to me, as far as a grade, I think Michael, Robbie, Michael was like a top 200, 250 guy for me. These guys are top 80 to 120-ish kind of guys for me. Michael Morris, which is harder to teach, run blocking or pass blocking? Michael, you're going to get a different answer from different people on this. I personally think run blocking is tougher. In today's game, I think run blocking is tougher. Back in the day, it was a little different. Back in the day, you kind of had, you know, you knew what your fronts were and teams didn't do a lot of exotic stuff until they got to third down. I think nowadays run blocking is a lot harder because you're seeing so much more movement. You're seeing teams be so more diverse in how they line up. Uh, it's not like it used to be. It used to be where all the exotic stuff came on the pass downs. You'd get the stunts and the twists and the blitzes and all that kind of stuff. Nowadays, I think it's harder to teach run blocking. I think there's a lot more involved in run blocking technique wise. I think there's, I think you can be a really good pass blocker with just talent more so than you can run blocking in today's game. I think it's changed a lot. Jack Foot says, if Notre Dame gets Shrouth, Hensman, and Taylor, who do you focus on recruiting in 2023? If they don't get Taylor, but those other guys, who do you recruit in 2023? Honestly, I don't think that changes. I don't think that answer changes uh, depending on if they get four or five. I think that the only thing that might change when you look at the, the 2023 class is just the number. Maybe you only, if you get five, maybe you only bring in three. If you get four, then maybe you need to bring in four again next year. But, you know, it, it's very early. The class isn't huge. As far as offers, they, TJ Shanahan is at the top of the board for me. Uh, he's a kid that grew up a Notre Dame fan. He's got to be on the board. Alex Birchmeyer from Virginia is a kid. There's a kid from Massachusetts named Samson Oaken, Oaken Lola. Very good player. His sophomore film was not overly impressive. Actually, I think it's freshman film because I don't think they play, he played as a sophomore. And he was really, really, uh, how do I say this, night? big as a freshman. He's lost a lot of weight, completely reshaped his body. Really athletic kid. He really impressed me at the Columbus camp, and uh, he's a guy that a lot of big-time schools are getting in on. So Notre Dame got in on him at a good time, and I was glad to see that. But he's a guy that they like. Josh Padilla is a kid that I think is going to go to Ohio State, but Notre Dame's on him. They're, 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 he's supposed to visit this summer. Caden Proctor is a highly ranked kid. You give it a shot with him. You know He's still a developing kid, but he's a 6'7", 300-pound, big, big, thick kid, and a good thick, like just like calves. I saw him at the – Columbus campus calves are like this big around. He's a giant, absolute giant. Harris Sewell's an interior player from Texas. So, but the moral of the story is at this point in time, it's about you're, you're shooting for studs. I mean, that's all it is. You're now, if you land the class that you talked about, Jack, at that point in time, if a guy's not, doesn't have an incredibly high ceiling, I don't care about rankings. I'm talking about ceilings. If a guy doesn't have a very a high ceiling, you don't recruit him. I think that would be the thing that if you can get that class that you talked about that I want, you're shooting for dudes, and that is it. Chris Ayers asks, you might have already answered, but how many O-line recruits are needed in this class? I think four is needed. I think that's the need is four. You need four. I would like five, ideally, but I think you need four. You can get if you if, and again, that's what I said. If you get Shrouth and Hensman and call it a day. And you can't get Taylor. Yeah, I'm bummed that you didn't get a, ta a pure tackle. And I also think Jake Taylor is a heck of a player. But that's still a really good offensive line class. And I think you would have met your needs. All right. Quint, uh, Chris Ayer says, I, I know he doesn't play O-line, but since I heard about him, I wanted to, to ask you what you think about Quinn Ewers. I think that's how you say his last name. I, I mean, to me, I think he's a really talented kid. I think he's a you know one of the top one of the top quarterbacks in the 2022 class. I think he's a little bit overhyped though. I, I this I, I saw somebody I don't know who it was two four seven or somebody was like he's the highest graded quarterback we've ever seen. I think that's in, I think that's just hype. I think it's all hype. But take away the hype, you know, is he what kind of player is he? He's a really good player. He's a top fifty recruit, no question about it. But I just think there's a little bit a little bit too much hype being uh, made about him right now. But still, again, very good player. Iman says, uh, if Notre Dame shifts to using more RPOs on offense long-term, will this affect the build athleticism traits that you look for in recruiting or will it predominantly come down to coaching? I don't think it changes it all that much, to be honest with you. I, I think that 
Uh, I think that when you look at the RPOs, the RPOs are simply just a, a counter to what you're already doing. I think that you're still going to run your normal run plays. Uh, I don't think I don't think it in fact impacts it at all because again, an RPO for the offensive line, you're run blocking. I mean, you're 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 running your outside zone, your inside zone, your counter, whatever it is that you run, you're running that. So I think I think what you do is you just build your run game and then you 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 put RPOs as part of that. It, it, there's not like one type of run game that works with RPOs. There's all types of different run games that work with RPOs. The stuff that Notre Dame can use for RPOs is different than what Oklahoma is going to run because Oklahoma is a different type of offense. Oklahoma is a gap scheme mostly. They run some zone, but they're a gap scheme. Notre Dame is more of a zone scheme. You know, Alabama is more of a power scheme. And so there's different types of players. Alabama is going to run different types of RPO RPOs off of different types of runs. So I don't think it necessitates it. You have to figure out what you believe in as a run offense. If you're a zone guy, then coach the zone and recruit to the zone. If you're a gap guy, if you're a pin and pull guy, then you then you recruit to that and coach to that. So Iman, it's a great question, but I but my answer is I, I think it's it's about figure out who what you believe in, find someone that can coach the heck out of it as an offensive line coach, and recruit to fit that system. You do those three things. I don't think it's scheme is important, zone, power scheme, gap scheme, whatever. I don't think that matters. I think the only other caveat that I would put in there is you have to make sure that you're go into a scheme that you can recruit to. But I think with Notre Dame, when it comes to offensive line, there's not a scheme they can't recruit to. If they if they want to get big physical power guys, they can do that. If they want to get athletic guys, they can do that. Uh, it's just about figure out what you believe in, find someone that can coach the heck out of it, and then recruit guys that fit that. I think that's, that's the key. So I, I don't think it shifts what they're looking for. At least it shouldn't. Now, it could shift it if they choose, hey, you know what? We want to be more of a pin and pull team. If that's what Tommy Reese and Jeff Quinn decide they want to do, then you can shift to that. But I don't think that has anything to do with RPOs. I think that's just because they chose that's the run name that they want to get to. All right, last question from Joseph Barrett. This is what he asks. So let's see here. Brian, how does staff propose handle the na nature of a position change or do coaching staffs in general stay away from the practice due to the transfer portal? Uh, you know, honestly, I, I think that, you know, I think when you're talking about position changes, Joseph, I think it's it's just about being honest with kids. I, I think it's about, number one, being honest when they recruit them. So, for example, if, you, if you're recruiting a kid to play corner, he doesn't want to play safety, you don't lie to him and say you're going to be a corner if you think you're going to move him to safety. You be honest with him. I think especially nowadays in the transfer portal situation, it benefits you as a, as a coaching staff, especially a place like Notre Dame, to be honest, because kids have so much more freedom now to move. I, I don't agree with it. I don't like it, but it's the reality. Um, and so, I, I, you know, when I look at it, I say, you, you be honest with kids. And I think most kids, if you're honest with them, from the moment you recruit them, hey, look, we like you, but... Look, we see you as maybe being a few different. We can play play a few different spots. Like you know, so so let's say you look at JoJo Johnson for example. Hey, look, we like you as a DB. If things may work out, maybe we move you to receiver. But you're honest with them, right? Uh, you look at Xavier Watts. I mean, look, they said to him, "Look, we want you as a receiver. We're going to recruit you as a receiver." But the defensive staff loved him as well. And so now, you if you if you were to go to a kid like that, I'm not saying they're going to do this. I'm just using an example. And you say, "Look, you're going to get every shot that to, to play receiver, but." There comes a point in time where we're good there, but we need help with safety. You know, we we want you to at least be open to the possibility of it. That's the other thing you do. And then the other part of that too, Joseph, is most staffs that I'm aware of, it's moving to kids a, is a is a suggestion. It's not a demand in most instances. You ask a kid, say, hey, look, we really like to move you. We think you could help us there. Are you willing to do it? And if a kid says no, then you don't move them. That's just that's just the reality. Um, you know, I just, yeah, that's the reality of it. So we'll have to see how that goes. So, uh, Tommy says, scroll up a few questions. I don't know what question you're talking about, Tommy. I, I didn't see another question from you. Oh, here we go. Um, here we go. Okay. I see it now. Looks like actually looks like I bumped down a little bit. So there's a few questions that I missed here. Okay, some questions popping up here that weren't there before. So let me find those and yeah, answer some of those. So thanks for thanks for that, Tommy. Thanks for the heads up on that. 
Kai S. Brian, when are you putting in an application to be a recruiter for Notre Dame? The answer would be never. I like my job. I like what I'm doing. All right. Uh, Coleman S Smith says, is Ty Chan a guard or only a tackle? I mean, I think if you can play tackle, I think you can play guard. I think the only exception would be is if you're really tall and you can't bend. You know, like if you can't play with good pad levels, a 6'8 guy, you may not be able to play guard. But Josh Lug plays guard, and he's 6'7 and a half, I think is what he's he measured in at. So, yeah, I, I think – um if you can play tackle in mo almost any instance, you can play guard. And, and I think Ty Chan could play guard, but I'm giving him every opportunity to play tackle. No question about it. Chris Ayer says, Ty Chan would seem like the athletic interior offensive lineman that Brian talked about. Yes, I think he can be that. But again, I, I want to see him play tackle. Absolutely. Uh, this is from Rob from Facebook. Why do we always land elite tight ends and linemen, but not elite receivers and cornerbacks? Number one is tradition. Uh, there's a history of it. I don't think that – I think also, too, part of the problem that Notre Dame has had in recent seasons has been the recruiter, not necessarily not being able to recruit receivers. I mean, you look at Notre Dame, the 10 years before Dell Alexander showed up, I mean, this is a staff that recruited Golden Tate. It's a staff that recruited Deval Kamara, a staff that recruited Michael Floyd, all highly ranked players. Shaq Evans was a highly ranked player. TJ Jones was a relatively highly ranked player. Uh, they recruited uh, DeVars Daniel was a relatively highly ranked player. They recruited Will Fuller. Obviously, he turned out to be a really good player. 2015, you know, they landed Miles Boykin and Equinemi St. Brown, two very highly ranked players. Uh, 2016, they landed Chase Claypool, very highly ranked player. He was a top 100 caliber guy. Kevin Stepherson was not a highly ranked guy, but a very talented player. 2016, they landed Javon McKinley, who was a top 100 recruit. I, I think. I think Mike Dembrock did a pretty darn good job of recruiting wide receivers. I think the the issues have been somewhat more recently. 2018 with Chip Long leading the way, they got Kevin Austin, who's a top 100 player. They got Micah Jones, who's a top 200 player. They got Braden Lindsey. They got Lawrence Keyes. I don't think receiver recruiting has been a problem. They got Jordan Johnson, who's a five star. I love Xavier Watts, Renzo Styles, and Deion Coles. You were both top 100 caliber players. I don't think recruiting receivers has been a question. I think developing receivers is more of the question. And running an offense that allows your receivers to maximize their ability. I've said this time and time again. Notre Dame does not lack talent a receiver. They've had some health problems at times. I think this past year, we'd have seen a lot more of Kevin Austin and Braden Lindsay if they weren't hurt. I, I don't think Tommy Reese only played Bray, Javon McKinley and, and Ben Skronik because he wanted to. Kevin Austin came into the season banged up. Braden Lindsay got hurt in fall camp. He was not healthy to start the season. They tried to play Kevin Austin once his foot came back. Then he got hurt again. So I think that was more of a factor in it. And then they just, their refusal to play the, the freshman was a, was a part of that too. But um, cornerback is a different animal. And I think a lot of that has to do with geography. If you look at a lot of the offensive linemen that Notre Dame has recruited, they're from pro Notre Dame areas. Uh, and you know, Quentin Nelson from Jersey, Mike McGlinchey's from Philly, Quentin Nelson's from New Jersey. Mike McG uh, actually, I said that already. Uh, Robert Hainsey's from Pittsburgh. Uh, Josh Lugs from from Pittsburgh. Liam Eikenberg's from Cle Catholic School in Cleveland. Tommy Kramer's from a Catholic school in Cincinnati. Uh, it's a lot more pro ge geography. There aren't a ton of elite corners being produced in those areas, and when they are, they happen to you know if, if you're an elite corner in Ohio, you, you're you're going to be more attracted to playing for Ohio State because of what they've been able to produce in the secondary compared to Notre Dame. So I think the other part of that too is not just geography. And where kids are located, but Notre Dame doesn't exactly have a history in recent years of of putting corners high in the NFL draft. Do that if you're able to start changing that. Just even if, like, let's just say they turn Cam Hart to a first round pick, just for argument's sake. All of a sudden, you're going to be able to say, "Hey, look, now we got we can coach some guys up, and we can get them there." And uh, you know that is uh, that is what I'm looking at. Chris Ayers asks, "What is your preferred recruiting service?" Uh, SI All American. Michael Morris asks, is the skill set between right tackle and left tackle that different? And and can a real good right tackle play left tackle? Yes. Yes. You, yeah. I mean, yeah, he can. I mean, we've seen that. We've seen um, Ronnie Stanley played right and left tackle. Mike McGlinch played right and left tackle. I think Robert Haynes, could have easily played left tackle if Liam Eikenberg wasn't around. Uh, I think the one difference between a left tackle and a right tackle, and really to me, there's it's the only real difference, is you'd prefer to have a guy that's longer and more athletic at left tackle prefer. Uh, Zach Martin was not long, but he was very athletic and very fundamentally sound. At the end of the day, your left tackle has to be a guy that, that you have full confidence in to protect the quarterback. 
and that to me is at the end of the day the, the big thing. Coleman Smith, do you think Quinn should recruit more tackles and guards? That's just my personal philosophy. I, that's what I believe personally, but I mean, he has a different approach. But for me, I, I prefer just the the more athletic guys. But again, at the same time, Carson Hinds was not a tackle, and I'd take him in a heartbeat. Billy Shrouth isn't necessarily tackle, although I think he has a tackle body. I'd recruit him in a heartbeat. So you always have to have exceptions to the rule. Sam Mustafer was an exception to the rule. You know, Sam played tackle in high school, but he was no one was ever going to recruit Sam Mustafer to be a tackle. He was a pure interior player, but they still went after him because he was a heck of a high school player, and he turned out to be a really good player at Notre Dame. Um, you're going to recruit guys like you know Zeke Carell. He wasn't a tackle, but he's a really good player. So there's always exceptions to the rule, but ideally, in theory, I'd rather have more tackles that you move to guard than the other way around. That's just my, my personal preference. Omar Austin says, asked this question, how much margin for error in O-line recruiting does a possible three positions on O-line being filled for three years create? So are you saying like basically getting three offensive line men in three classes in a row? If, if that's what you're asking, then I think that's a, a, a you know, number one, you haven't been able to fill out your depth tray. You should always be able to fill out your two deep in a three-year stretch, in my opinion. In three years, you have to be able to fill out your two deep. And that's why I say the four is the need. You don't need five because you have two in 2017. You had five last year. That's seven. You need, to me, four because one of the guys that they've gotten recently to me is, is not a guy that I view as a, a top-level Notre Dame kind of guy. So you want to be at least 10 in, in a three-year stretch. I'd prefer closer to – I kind of prefer to have an average of four a year is how I like to look at it. Because you never really want to have more than 15 or 16 offensive linemen on your roster. You recruit four a year. You're going to have a guy leave here and there. You're going to have some guys going in the NFL or medicals or whatever. I, I kind of like a nice, healthy four every year, occasionally five, occasionally three, about an average of four. Because what happens if you only bring three a year in Omar is, you know, somebody's going to not pan out. Somebody's not going to get hurt. Somebody's going to get hurt. And depending on like the position fits for the guys that aren't hurt or, or do pan out, you may be stuck with not a real good offensive line from a fit. You may have to be start more guard types or more tackle types or whatever the case may be. And now you're a little low on numbers at those positions too. When because guys are not going to pan out, somebody's going to get hurt. That's just that's just how it's going to be. Uh, Coleman Smith says, "Which would you play, Hensman or, or Tanona at center? I play Hensman at center because I think Tanona needs Tanona can play center, but I don't want him snapping the ball if I don't have to have him snapping the ball. He's I want the more athletic guy." playing center and Hinsman's the more athletic guy. That's who I'd prefer to play center. But I mean, if they want to play Tonona there, I'm fine with that too. But I would, uh, I'd prefer to have Hinsman there for sure. Uh, Kai S says, yes, Cyrus Moss, the D line. Uh, I definitely think he's too thin for college. Number one, Kai, the last time we saw him on film, he was a sophomore in high school. So I think it's a little unfair to say he's too thin for defensive end right now. I mean, I could the list of guys that I could give you that were that are highly NFL draft picks at defensive line that were 200, 205 pounds of sophomores in high school is long. It's a long list. Adi Ogandiji as a sophomore in high school is about 205, 210 pounds. Cyrus Moss is over 200 pounds. There, there's no doubt about that. He was as a sophomore. So I understand what you're saying, but yeah, I think uh I I think to me it's it's I, I think he's excellent. I mean, I agree with you on Zach Rice. I don't agree with you on Cyrus Moss, but I've really appreciated your contributions to the show tonight. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, Omar Austin, you spooked me again at the end of the earlier show. Please tell me this new offense isn't a one or two and year and done. I wish I could tell you that, but the way that they're recruiting receivers in the 2022 class, I have my doubts. It, it uh, I really have my doubts. Let's see here. Rob says, I think Spindler and Fisher are going to be all Americans. Chris Ayer says, Fisher truly loves Notre Dame. I think those are both possible. Uh, Christopher says, when you watched Quentin Nelson as a high schooler, did you think he was a college guard? Yes, I did. I did. I, and it wasn't so much that Quentin had, didn't have the, the athleticism to play tackle, but the thing I said about him is he didn't have, I don't, and I still believe this. I don't know if his demeanor fits tackle. I think he is such a, just a, punishing kind of guy that if you put him a tackle where he has to be a little bit more patient tackles have to be more patient 
I don't know if that fits his personality. So yeah, I did think he was a, a guard coming out of high school. Now, it, I didn't have a chance to, I don't believe I ranked that class because that was kind of in my getting out of coaching, getting into recruiting things. So I don't know if I officially ranked them back then, but yes, uh, he, he was a guy that I did view as a guard. Tommy Leonard asks, Coach, if a left-handed version of Trevor Lawrence commits another name in, let's say, two years, a guy you know will take over year one, does that change how you recruit right versus left tackles? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Because, again, as I said earlier, I think there needs to be – you want good pass protectors on both sides. But at the other the other part of it is is you can just move if, – if you really felt that you had to have that, that guy in the blind side, you just move your left tackle to right tackle. I mean, let's not forget – with the exception of Zach Martin, every left tackle that Notre Dame has had that's gotten drafted since Zach Martin has played right tackle, either started it for a year, which is what happened with Ronnie Stanley and, and Mike McGlinchey, they both, their first years as starters were as right, right tackles. Liam Eikenberg didn't start at right tackle, but he played some right tackle uh, when he was coming off the bench in, I think, 2017. I think it was. I think he played some right tackle that year. I, I'm pretty sure he did. But so it's it's not that difficult. It's, now some guys can't play left-handed or right-handed, and, and that 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 is a legitimate thing. But most can. It just takes some time. Answer that question. So I think we're back now to to where we were. See if we have any final questions to wrap up here, real quick. Coleman Smith asks, what do you think of the Freeling kid from South Carolina? He's one of the 2023 offensive linemen. Coleman, honestly, I've not watched him yet, to be honest with you. Um, and I've said this in other shows. I'm just not right now super, super locked in on studying film of 23 kids just yet. There are some that I've watched, obviously. There's some kids I saw at camp. Right now, getting through June, my focus is going to be on the 2022 class for the most part. Chris Ayer says, two more spots in the O-line for the chat. Give the two. If they can only have two, boy, oh boy, I'm not answering that question because <laughs> I, I mean it's too hard of a, it's too hard of an answer. I mean it's like, you know, I I want I want Hensman, I want Shrouth, I want Taylor, I want I mean look, you give me two of those three, how about that? If you can only have two, give me two of those three. Pick any two of those three, and I think Notre Dame will be happy. Rob says I think Notre Dame has the chance to get the best line class in the in the Kelly ten years. I think that's going to be tough. Um, I think the 2014 class was pretty special with Quentin Nelson, Alex Bars, and Sam Mustfer. That was pretty good. Uh, I think I think Jimmy Byrne was the fourth guy, and Jimmy Byrne didn't do anything at Notre Dame, but he was a pretty good football player coming out of St. Ignatius. You know, I I think the I think the 2017 class is pretty darn good. When you look at Robert Haynes, he was a top hundred guy. Josh Lug, Aaron Banks, uh, and then Dylan Gibbons. That was pretty good. The 2013 class was really good. You had Steve Elmer, Mike McGlinchey, John Montalus. Uh, Hunter Biven was a top 100 recruit coming out of high school that year, too. And then there was a fifth guy that I'm forgetting. So it was, it was McGlinchey, Elmer, Biven, Montalus. Oh, and Colin McGovern, who until he kind of had a little bit of a of a breakdown, he was um, he was pretty good. Chris Harris says, thanks for the great show, Brian. I appreciate it, Chris. And hey, there's still a lot of people hanging around. If, you, if you're going to bail here soon and we're going to wrap up soon, please hit the like button before you leave and make sure that you subscribe to uh, to our channel. Uh, Jonathan, oh, we're about to have some problems, Jonathan. Got here super late, but I'll have some great content for later. How's it going, y'all? Jonathan, you're the guy that has been begging me to do an offensive line thing, and you came up late? My man, come on, buddy. Let we're gonna have to have some. We're gonna have to have a conversation later, but yes, there'll be plenty to get caught up on. All right, Omar Austin. I mean Fisher, Rocco, and Carol, and a possible Tosh. Let me see what was that in response to Omar. I'm sorry, I missed the other part of that question. I don't. I don't see that. Okay, uh, Kai says I honestly do not understand why we need four to five offensive linemen in a year, especially currently due to the pandemic. There could be O linemen staying for a sixth year, which would create less PT, or am I wrong? So, first of all, I don't see anyone that you want staying for a sixth year. Because here, here's the way I look at it, Kai, is number one, is if it's it's the reason I don't want the kid from Marshall. If at Notre Dame, if a kid's good enough that you want him back for a sixth year, he ain't coming back because he's going to the NFL, right? And and so, like, I mean, most of these guys, like Liam Eikenberg could have came back this year. 
but he wasn't going to because he was going to be a high draft pick, right? Robert Hainsey could have come back for another year. He didn't. Across the board, they all could have come back. None of them came back because they're all going to the NFL. So th that's the other part of it, too. And I don't think you need four or five every single year. You can't take five every year. There's not enough scholarships on your entire team to handle that. I think the reason that Notre Dame needs five last year and another four or five this year is because they're, they're overcoming some things that have happened in the past. Number one, you look at 2020 class, only two linemen in it. The 2019 class has four had four guys in it, but one of them's already transferred, John Holmes said, and then another one. So then he was basically replaced by Hunter Spears. When a Hunter Spears has injuries, he only had three in that class, and there's only one, two offensive linemen left on your roster from the 2018 class, and that's John Dirksen and Jared Patterson. They could both be gone. So the, the numbers in the older classes are not good, and that's why I think this class needs to be bigger again but high-impact talent. And then next year you can be three to four, and then hopefully that gets them on a consistent four. Occasionally you want to bring in five if there's injuries or guys that go to the NFL. Other years you may only bring three for the reasons you talked about. You may have a, an older line in a couple years, but you know, to me, I don't think the pandemic is going to have the the impact on guys staying for a lot of extra years that people are thinking. I think it's going to be good for like guys like Bo Bauer, maybe Tariq Bracy, but may, you know, he's got to earn a spot. But you know, maybe Shane Simon, but guys like guys like Elaine Michaelberg, he's not coming back for six years. Tosh Baker's not going to be at Notre Dame for six years. I mean, he could, but he's not gonna because if he if he's not good enough to go to the NFL by then you're not going to want to bring him back to be a starter he's going to be a backup and you're not going to want him anyway. So I understand that thought but um you know I don't I don't think that's that's how it would it would pan out. Chris Ayers, how does your mind stay so sharp? I know it's your job but you do it really well. I appreciate that. I appreciate that very much. Um And then last question, Chris Ayers, this is a, a great question. Why did the kid from Marshall make an all American team and why didn't he go pro now? And I think that's a great question. And, and look, he's a shorter kid. He's not real, he's not real tall. He's kind of short and squatty. He's a big, strong physical kid. But he's not a super athlete. I don't think he moves the needle for Notre Dame. He's got more experience than, you know, Christophic and, and Rocco Spindler. But to me, bringing him in, maybe it helps you a tad this year. I don't really think it does. But what it what it also does is it then stalls your development for de getting those kids ready for 2022, and and as I said earlier in the show earlier, Chris, if you haven't watched it, check it out because we talked a little bit about this. But for me, I'd rather need three or four games to get ready. I'd rather have the young kids go through some growing pains against Florida State, Toledo, and Purdue to get them ready for Wisconsin to game four. Then I would I'd try to get a new starter ready for Ohio state in game one next year. I just, I don't, I don't want to see it. So, um, yeah, I just, I'm with you. And then last question he asked about, uh, what are your feelings on the Tulsa corner possibly coming in? I love a Caleb Evans. I think he's a really good player. I think that Notre Dame doesn't need him, but I think Notre Dame's in a situation where he's, he's too good not to, to, to make a run at in my opinion. So I, I think, I think that's a situation where you're going to see that, um, uh, I, I think you're going to see that. They're, that's why they're making a run at him. Is because he's just too good to pass up. Now, will he? They get him. We'll find out. I'm going to try to make a call after uh, I get off the phone here and see if I can find some things out. But, um, but yeah, and to your follow, yeah, I think he starts if he comes. He, he'd be their best corner than many of these steps on campus. Now he'd have to win the job. But with all due respect to, I mean, I think Clarence Lewis is a nice player. He's coming along. Treat Bracy, Cam Hart, and all those guys. But. I think he's their best. He'd be their best player, and, and it's Notre Dame, Texas, and Missouri are the three schools. He's he look, he put out a top five that had Jackson State and Texas Tech in it, but it's going to be Notre Dame, Texas, or Missouri. That's what it's going to come down to. But yeah, Caleb Evans is really, really good. And see, that's this that's the difference between him and the kid from Marshall is that Caleb Evans is is he moves the needle for Notre Dame. I mean, and the other thing is Caleb Evans can still has two years of eligibility left. And so you're not just bringing him in to start this year, but you hopefully you can convince him to come back in 2022 and, and play then too. So that's the difference in there. But anyway, everybody, thanks for being part of the show tonight. I appreciate everybody watching film with me and uh, and going through the offensive line. We're going to try to do some more of these here over the next week before the visits get too deep so we can get our rankings out. But um, it's, an, it's an impressive board. Now it's just about Coach Quinn closing. So before you leave, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. 
and hit the no- notifications bell so that you know when we have shows coming out. We'll give you try to give you as much advance notice as possible. Make sure you hit those reminders when you see those things come out. If you like the hat, if you want to buy some Irish Breakdown gear, support the channel in any way. We've got our Irish Breakdown merch store link down below. We have our Patreon link down below, which we just started, and I'm not even sure if that's fully working or not yet. We'll have to see. Um, but appreciate everybody being part of it. Appreciate all support and appreciate this awesome community that we're building. So hope you enjoyed the film. Jonathan, you've got a lot of watching to make up on. I expect you to have watched this film before we get into tomorrow's one o'clock chat. So we'll be back tomorrow at one o'clock. Vince and I will be talking. We'll be getting back into our position previews as we get ready to, as we do sort of our countdown to kickoff. So everybody have a great night and talk to you again very, very soon.